Uh, that's exactly what I'm saying, and they're the points that I'm coming on to do. The aims of the government to, to create this uh, generation of smoke-free uh, people as time progresses will just not work. It's not working now when it's banned for those uh, young people, those 100,000 young people who are taking up smoking every year, uh, and it's already banned for them. Um, in 2021, trading standards seized just over £7.8 million in illicit tobacco. This from the UK government's own guesstimate that illicit tobacco accounts for over 16% of the market. And that's a loss of £2.8 billion, not million, billion in tax and duty. We've also heard that this bill is, is based on uh, the New Zealand model. Now, New Zealand does not have an illicit tobacco problem like we do here in the UK. New Zealand is 2,000 500 miles away from the nearest big trader, Australia. The UK is 23 miles away from the continent. The two countries cannot be compared. The New Zealand model has now failed and they performed a U-turn, as we've heard. Instead, the New Zealand government continues to support initiatives to pe provide people with practical tools and support to help them quit. These include ensuring the provision of effective services to stop smoking, providing access to alternative products to help smoking cessation, and to promote social media marketing campaigns to stop smoking and vaping. The bill here in the UK provides little guidance nor support on cessation to those who already smoke. I mis myself was one of the 6.4 million smokers here in the UK but stopped smoking just over a year ago. And I found very little help and support from the government, despite all the hype around what is being done. In fact, having tried virtually every product on the market to give up smoking, even hypnosis, the only product that eventually made me give up was heated tobacco. This product, however, is not included in His Majesty's Government's bill before us today as a cessation tool. Instead, the sale of which for the young people is to be banned under the bill. Even the Kiwis recognised what a great cessation tool it is and did not include it in their bill. Instead, they put it in the arsenal of tools and recognised the benefits of it for cessation. In Japan, where 18.6 million people smoke, 25% of ex-smokers quit using heated tobacco and they are already seeing the health benefits through their health system. Similarly, the country with the lowest smoking rate in the world, Sweden, over half of the ex-smokers have quit using something called uh, snooze, something that is actually already banned here in the UK. And ironically, the government has put all the reds into the vaping scene for cessation. However, 30% of all those people who vape still smoke cigarettes. Not only that, but what PHE call alternative nicotine delivery devices, such as vaping products, the bill doesn't include heated tobacco, which is delivered via just that very same device. So to summarise, Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill isn't cut out for what the ambitions of the government are. It follows a failed model that was devised in New Zealand, who, unlike the UK, does not have the same issue with illicit tobacco. It depends on a morsel of cash to an incredibly stretched trading standards that is operating on a budget that is half of what it was 15 years ago to police and enforce the policy of this bill. It underestimates the scale of the illicit tobacco trade already in the UK and will promote illicit tobacco trade even further in the future. And it fails to promote cessation to the current 6.4 million smokers in the UK and fails to recognise the many more products which are better than cigarettes for people to quit, like heated tobacco. It fails on every level. And finally, Madam <laughs> Deputy Speaker, if the government, and indeed this House, were serious about stopping people smoking, why not just set an arbitrary date in the future where smoking will be banned completely, either in partaking or selling. This will give us time for serious investment in cessation and it will also give us serious investment of time to stop these illegal gangs and smugglers. Yes. Um, just to remind colleagues that if they go quite a long way over the guidance, it does mean that others will have less time to speak. And the guidance was seven minutes. Alex Cunningham. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I draw attention to my role as a Vice Chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Smoking and Health, an APG 
which supports this bill, particularly the commitment to creating a smoke-free generation by raising the age of sale for tobacco. This will be the most impactful public health intervention since the introduction of smoke-free legislation under the last Labour government. This bill is particularly welcome after years of government inaction on tobacco that put us well behind schedule for achieving the smoke-free 2030 ambition. According to Cancer Research UK, we are currently not on track to be, to be smoke free until 2039, almost a decade later than planned and even later for the most deprived. I would also like to welcome the new funding committed to local tobacco control activity and national mass media campaigns. This will go some way to fixing the damage done by over a decade of cuts to public health funding. These have fallen disproportionately on local stop smoking services, which are a vital component of our strategy for reducing smoking rates. I am pleased that the Government has now recognised the importance of these services. Now, since the legislation to raise the age of, progressive, age of sale progressively one year at a time was announced, tobacco manufacturers have argued that the legislation will be burdensome to business and they have paid for advertising, urging retailers to lobby against the legislation. Despite this, a survey carried out by NEMS Market Research for Action on Smoking and Health shows that over half of a representative sample of retailers are supportive, compared to only a quarter who are opposed. The tobacco industry, of course, has formed for trying to use retailers to lobby against tobacco laws. The Tobacco Retailers Alliance, a trade body 100% funded by tobacco manufacturers, funded the Save Our Shops campaign against the display ban and the No to Plain Packs against standardised packaging for cigarettes. Both use exactly the same argument now being used to campaign against raising the age of sale today, and it will put, that it will put a terrible burden on small businesses, being impractical to implement and increase illicit trade. On both occasions, the campaigns were exposed as being fronts for the tobacco industry, and legislation was passed and implemented very successfully by retailers. Indeed, a 2022 survey carried out by NEMS for Ash found that the vast majority of small retailers reported there had been no negative impact on their business due to the display ban or plain packs. My region, the North East, has been hit particularly hard by the tobacco epidemic, with 117,000 deaths from smoking since the turn of the century and thousands more added each year. This is not to mention the thousands more living with tobacco-related illnesses. As with every other region, this suffering is concentrated in the most deprived groups and areas. While around 13% of adults in the North East smoke, that rises to 21% among adults in routine and manual occupations, 28% of adults in social housing and 41% of adults with serious mental health conditions. Now, we are fortunate in the North East to benefit from the incredible work done by our regional tobacco control office, Fresh. Fresh was set up in 2005 in response to our region having the highest smoking rates in the country. As a result of dedicated and sustained collaboration and investment from local authorities and the NHS, rates have fallen further and faster in the North East than anywhere else in the country. 13.1% of the adult population now smoke, compared to 29% less than, 10, than 20 years ago. The North East is a prime example of what can be achieved with an effective regional tobacco control programme. Fresh is now funded by both the local authorities and the Integrated Care Board in the North East region, a model for regional funding which is also in place in Greater Manchester, and I would encourage other regions to follow suit. Children are especially vulnerable to second-hand smoke, which greatly increases their chances of developing a host of illnesses. The Royal College of Physicians has estimated that smoking by parents and carers is estimated to be responsible for around 5,000 children being admitted to hospital each year, primarily from respiratory conditions. That's why, in 2011, I tabled a private member's bill to ban smoking in cars where children are present, aided at that time by the British Lung Foundation. Despite the strong public health case for this measure, it was not initially welcomed by the government or the opposition, and it took a long, hard fight camp and campaign to get it over the line. Four years later, in 2015, 
legislation banning smoking in cars carrying children was put on the statute book with strong cross-party and public support. This legislation played... Yeah. Talk about the ban on smoking in cars when children are present. I just wonder whether he could tell the House how many prosecutions have taken place for that offence. Interesting question. There has only been a handful of prosecutions. That is because that legislation yeah, has effective. played an important role exactly. and the people have actually adopted it. In the 2008 polling by YouGov for Ash found that banning smoking in cars was supported by less than half of all smokers. By the time of my backbench bill, it had risen to 62%. And after the ban came into effect, it was supported by 82%. Now, the lesson, Madam Deputy Speaker, to be learned from this and other tobacco regulations is that support has grown significantly over time for tougher regulation of tobacco, and that after measures are put in place, support continues to grow, particularly among smokers. We've come a long way in our attitudes to smoking since I became an MP in 2010, and I've enjoyed, I've actually enjoyed campaigning on it, but I look forward to seeing this bill pass into law before I step down. Not only will this legislation prevent future generations from acquiring this terrible addiction, but it offers the most direct path towards making smoking truly obsolete in our society. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I'd like to point out three things before starting. First of all, I used to be a smoker. I'm probably one of the earliest adopters of vaping um, in the UK, of certainly amongst them. Um, second, I'm a member of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Responsible Vaping, whose chair will no doubt speak today. And uh, thirdly, I draw uh, members' attention to my uh, declaration of members' interest, where I chair an advisory board to a company that may or may not be doing vapes. I don't know. Um, but the main comment I would like to make is this, is that actually here in the UK, we've been incredibly successful with our smoking cessation policies thus far. We really have. And in fact, we've been the envy of the world in terms of the rates at which smoking cessation has taken place in the UK. Yes, we're behind target. Yes, according to the Khan Review, we may not hit the 2030 mark, but we've been incredibly successful. And I've been all around the world talking about our success. People have been asking us, how have you done this? And I've been explaining, well, actually, it was industry that did it. They came up with this fantastic device called a vape. Um, initially, it was all a bit dodgy and a bit shaky. You know, people were mixing it in Manchester in their bars. It was all very complicated. We've got a grip on it. Now there's regulation around it. And now it's um, provided people are doing it legally. It's, it's safe and it's usable. And millions, millions of smokers have stopped smoking through using vaping devices. So it's a huge success story. Um, and um, the thing that makes me smile the most is when I look at the number of children who smoke. You know, back in, I think it was in um, two th uh, 1982, literally 13% of 11 to 15 year olds smoked. Secondary school kids were smoking. Actually, I remember I was around during the day and some, many of us remember it. Everyone used to be smoking behind the bike sheds. Um, then in um, 2003, 9% of people smoked. Good progress, good progress, you know. Um, and then by 2010, only 5% of school children were smoking. And today, it's only 1% of school children smoking. This is a record of success. This is not a huge disaster that suddenly needs a radical change of policy to resolve the issue. It, really, it merely requires, in my view, an upping of the ante when it comes to enforcement, an upping of the ante when it comes to messaging, um, rather than this kind of rather draconian approach. But I do welcome the bill in two ways. First of all, I think that the, vaping, the measures around vaping are pretty strong, and I think they're pretty good, and I think most of the House would agree that we do need to um, look at packaging so it's not marketed to children, of course, and we need to look at flavours, not the flavours themselves, and I would urge the Secretary of State in that section of the bill to perhaps look at the descriptors rather than the actual flavour as a regulatory, a regulatory point, um, because it, it, do, it doesn't matter to a uh, smoker who wishes to quit, whether it's called blueberry or anything else, all that matters is that flavour does exist, even if it has a reference number and a plain package, it doesn't matter. What matters is that the flavour exists, which then, such as my um, honourable friend used, mango, I tend to use blueberry. You've got to make sure the flavour exists to encourage smokers to, 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 to shift, but it doesn't necessarily have to have a name on the outside of the pack that can be marketed to children. Um, I think the, 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 the um, other key issue I would like to raise in terms of the vaping part of the bill is that um, this is unbelievable. We have got the entire 
tobacco industry ready to open their checkbook and pay for all of trading standards and enforcement. They're ready to do it. We've got the entire vaping industry, the vaping associations, the vaping retail, everybody is ready to say, we don't want these cowboys in the industry. We want to drive them out as much as you do, because basically it gives us a bad name and it encourages nanny state politicians to come and meddle with us and interfere with us and stop us doing our lawful trade. So basically there is a vast sum of money available from the industry to be used by the government hopefully directly through trading standards, to ensure that all of the practices that we've heard mentioned today, um, are, are, we see an end to them because trading standards doesn't just have a few million here and there. It has hundreds of millions and hundreds of new staff in able to, so they're able to do their job in basically driving the cowboys out of the industry. But I have to say that bans don't work. They really don't work. I'm not going to make a high-principled speech about freedom and things. Just quite frankly, they just don't work. Bhutan, Bhutan tried it, didn't work. Malaysia tried it, didn't work. Um, Australia got very close to doing it for their very complicated legislation, didn't work. Guess what? Smoking rates went up. Guess what? Smoking rates amongst kids went up. They don't work. New Zealand really had a good stab at it, and then they said, nah, it's unconstitutional, and it's probably not going to work as well. So the idea that we in the United Kingdom would now take, the, take up the, being the vanguard of this is ridiculous. And I think the only thing I can say is this, is that for goodness sake, our policy as it stands at the moment is working. We just need to do it faster um, and with more money available for enforcement and to get on with the, 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 the um, changing of the descriptors um, in order to ensure that fewer people, fewer uh, people are smoking, and particularly our children. Nobody wants our children to smoke. Nobody wants people to die. So this false argument I've been hearing today that somehow anybody who doesn't agree with a generational ban is somehow evil and wants people to die, it's just, it's just, it's, it's really, it really upsets me that we would re resort to that sort of language. Um, so the final thing I would say, and then I will sit down, Madam Deputy Speaker, is this, is that, um, um, the main reason why I cannot support the bill today, I mean, I really can't, is, is, the, is the generational smoking ban. I would perfectly happily support the rest of the bill. Uh, I cannot support that. If the government had been bold enough, or if people were bold enough to simply say, right, we're going to ban smoking to the age of 21, I'd have huge reluctance, but i go, yeah, fair enough. And do you know why? Because we're treating people the same. What we're doing here is a huge constitutional change. We're saying that somehow um, two, uh, two adults are not treated in the same way. It's inequality under the law. Even in Malaysia, their attorney general said, we can't do that. And they're not nearly as civilised as we are here. Um, and um, also in, um, in several other countries, they've come to the same conclusion. I guess if it does pass the day, because somehow... I don't know how we've got into this state. It's so unnecessary. There's so many other more important things to be doing in the world at the moment. But, but now that we're in this, in this place, um, if this bill somehow gets through with Labour, of course Labour will always love bans. I get that. That's fine. But um, at the end of the day, if it gets through with Labour support, it's, forgive me for being political, but it, politically, it's ridiculous to have our Prime Minister, who's got enough things to deal with, putting through a bill with Labour support. I mean, why on earth would you do it at this stage? Yes, I'll give away. I agree wholeheartedly with my honourable friend. Uh, surely this should be something that should evolve. That, as he's highlighted, the statistics show that young people, now very few actually do smoke, so let things gradually evolve rather than impose it. And isn't it clear that after the New Zealand example, it simply doesn't work? And I will now draw him up to a conclusion. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, for your patience. Um, and um, I conclude with this. Um, I cannot vote for a bill that treats adults um, unequally, you know, unequally in, in law. You know, this, this creates a complete precedent in the United Kingdom where people, um, where adult human beings in the United Kingdom, citizens, are treated differently. It's inequality under the law. I cannot support that. And, um, and um, I think also we're making a huge political mistake. I, I really hope even at this late stage we can make some amendments or change the way it works, or at least say there's a condition. We're going to bring it through in law, but it will, can be enacted only by a future government if, for example, smoking rates aren't, for argument's sake, say below 3% by 2035. In that way, we have the political win, we've got it through, it's on the legislation, but it actually hasn't been enacted at the moment. Thank you, Madam Legislator. And I've got absolutely nothing against interventions, but I would, um, I would suggest that if um, colleagues are going to take interventions, they still stick to the guidelines. Helen Hayes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak in support of this important bill. Smoking is entirely harmful, and there are no benefits. 
Cancer Research UK is clear that tobacco remains the single biggest cause of cancer in the UK, causing an estimated 125,000 deaths per year, one person every five minutes. Smokers, on average, lose 10 years of their life expectancy and face lifelong health complications. Despite the protestation of tobacco companies, smoking also has a detrimental effect on our economy. Action on smoking and health estimates that the overall cost of productivity losses and health and care needs caused by smoking cost the UK a staggering £17.3 billion every year. We've come a long way in recent decades in reducing smoking rates. The last Labour government led the way on smoking harms, raising the legal smoking age to 18, banning cigarette advertising in shops and introducing the transformative ban on smoking in enclosed public spaces and workplaces. It is now hard to recall just how society ever thought that smoke-filled restaurants, pubs and tube carriages were remotely acceptable. I'm not going to give way at this stage, I'm afraid. It is, yet it is still the case that more than one in ten adults, around 6.4 million people, are smokers. Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to pay tribute to my constituent, Gower Tan. Gower began to smoke at the age of 13. His father was also a lifelong smoker and died early at the age of just 66 from lung cancer. This was devastating for Gower and his family and led him to give up smoking at the age of 40. Gower has since become a tireless campaigner for Cancer Research UK, first as an ambassador and more recently as part of their staff team. Gower and his family know, as well as anyone, the pain and heartache that smoking can cause and the deep sorrow of knowing that the death of a loved one was preventable. Like my honourable friend, the Shadow Secretary of State, I fully support this bill's measures to ban smoking for anyone born after 2009, freeing future generations from the health impacts of tobacco. I also welcome the bill's urgently needed measures to regulate the advertising and restrict the availability of vapes to children and teenagers. On this side of the House, we have been calling for action on this for a long time. Last year, I introduced a 10-minute rule bill on the advertising of vapes to children. One in five 11 to 15-year-olds in England used vapes in 2021, and underage vaping has increased by 50% in the last three years. This is a really dramatic increase. Five years ago, this was not a significant concern, but now it is raised with me by every school I visit. Teachers are routinely having to manage the disruption that addiction causes in the classroom. Vaping has a really important role in smoking cessation, and that role should not be undermined by this legislation. But while vaping is far less harmful than smoking, it is not a harmless activity. Last year, 40 children were admitted to hospital with vaping-related issues. There is evidence of respiratory harm and impacts on mental health and concentration levels. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, we can see what the strategy of the vaping companies is. They are seeking to secure the future demand for their products by getting children addicted today. It is frankly absurd that e-cigarette manufacturers claim that they are not targeting children. In displays across the country, there are brightly coloured advertising for vapes mimicking popular brands and characters. Flavours such as gummy bears, Skittles, Tutti Frutti and Cherry Cola are clearly designed to appeal to children and vapes are being openly promoted to children on social media. While I support the bill today, it would be remiss not to ask what has taken the government so long. They have had repeated opportunities to introduce new regulations on the marketing of vapes. My honourable friend, the member for the City of Durham, put forward an amendment in November 2021 to the Health and Care Bill to ban the branding of, uh, branding of vapes that appeal to children, whilst the Electronic Cigarettes Branding, Promotion and Advertising Bill introduced last year would have banned e-cigarettes and vaping products from being advertised to appeal directly to children. These delays will only have led to more children experimenting with e-cigarettes and becoming addicted to recreational vaping. Today we have a genuine opportunity to stop the harm of nicotine addiction and free future generations from the health impacts of smoking. On this side of the House we are clear that we will put the health of children and young people first. A government that cannot command the support of its own MPs for a flagship piece of legislation should surely step aside 
call a general election and allow someone else to do the job. Yeah, 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 yeah. Alexander Stafford. Much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. And first, I want to be uh, almost declare an opposite interest. I have never smoked a cigarette in my life. I have never smoked a cigar in my life. I've never even put one to my very lips. Oh. Yet I am against this bill. It's very good. Not because I have any vested interests uh, from tobacco lobby or for, because I'm a, be a smoker or ex smoker. Because I am a lover of freedom. Yeah. I am a lover of choice. I am a lover of information. <coughs> and to me, that is very vital. Now, I am, you know, I'm not one of the older members of the House, but I'm not one of the younger members of the House. But I remember at school, we were drummed in the whole time about the evils of smoking, how bad smoking is for you. And I don't think there's any member of this House or any person in this country who does not know the, the evil of smoking, the health degradation of smoking, the damage to lives of families of smoking, because that is drummed in every single step of the way. Yeah. And that is right, because I think, think smoking is wrong. I don't like it, and I wish people wouldn't smoke it. But if we believe in freedom of choice, if we believe in freedom of independence of mind, if we uh, believe in people making informed choices, we should let them do what they want as long as they have the facts ahead of them. And we do provide the facts. The NHS, the, the Stop Smoking Bodies, have done an amazing job over the last few decades of making sure everyone does know the facts. So no one can go away and say when they start smoking or vaping or anything like that, they don't know the full implications of what they are doing. They do, and they do. And we know they know that because, as we already mentioned in this debate, the amount of people, the amount of young people especially, smoking has absolutely collapsed <coughs> over the last uh, few decades. The honourable member for uh, Windsor mentioned correctly that only 1% of school children smoke. Now, 1% is terrible. That was far too many. But compared to what it was, that is really good news. And I mentioned earlier on uh, in my interventions that actually children don't smoke anymore. They don't take a cigarette generally as a whole. And that is not where the battle is. Because I believe that battle has won. We're just fighting the last rearguard action of smoking. And this is why I think the bill is fundamentally wrong. It's fighting yesterday's wars. It's not really fighting tomorrow's wars. Yes, the, act the aspect of vaping is incredibly important. And that is what we really need to focus on. That is where we and the government needs to focus attention on. Dealing with things like super strength vapes, such as we talked about some of the, the marketing, the advertising towards children, and that is incredibly important. I'm glad the bill is going some way uh, to rectify that. The prohibition of free distribution of vaping products to under 18s is, once again, this is great news. But instead of actually dividing our time between focusing on a dying industry, which frankly we are doing in a very bizarre, puritanical way, out of stamping out some people's uh, choice of freedom. Like, who is to say, you know, why can't a 21 year old in a few years' time celebrate their graduation with a cigar if they want to? Why not? Why can't uh, someone celebrate, you know, model a birth of a child with a cigar in the future? Or maybe the pinch of snuff? Who are we to say that isn't their choice to make? <coughs> who are we to say you shouldn't celebrate that that way? I have many vices, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I like a, a glass of beer or, or a pint of wine or something like that uh, every, every now and again. Uh, uh, and I know in my heart and heart it is wrong for me and probably limits some of my, my health. I, am, I know that. I drink that. I eat burgers and chips and I accept that it is fundamentally sometimes life shortening. But does it make my life better? Do I enjoy doing it? Yes. Yes, I do. I enter into these with the full knowledge of what I am doing. And then this is the drops the matter. Now we're talking about cigarettes, cigars, uh, snuff, shisha. Why are we not going to say tomorrow or, ne or next day that burgers are bad for you, that red wine is bad for you, that all these little things that you sometimes enjoy in moderation, which make life worth living. And sometimes people do want that bit of enjoyment. We are saying no. We're going to sit here and say, you cannot have that choice. We know better than you. We are taking that choice away from you. Now, as long as everyone has uh, the knowledge about what uh, tobacco products does to you, then yes, we should give them the choice. And that is terribly important. And I was also uh, confused, but once again, this is a sledgehammer to crack a nut. We're banning all tobacco products. <coughs> How many people in this country, let's say, do snuff? Not many. So why are we impeding on their, their liberty? There's not an epidemic of children taking snuff at schools. So why are we banning that? There's not a massive health risk for huge vast of, of impact of the NHS on snuff. Yet we are banning it. This is crazy. We are banning things that are not having a huge impact on the economic and the health of our nation. 
and that concerns me greatly. <coughs> now, one, one country that has gone through this motion is New Zealand. They banned it, but then they overturned it. If it was such success, why is New Zealand not double downing on it? Why is it not going far, farther? And fundamentally, the biggest issue I have over all of this is this rolling age of consent. Because fundamentally, yeah. this is discriminatory. Adults are adults, but adults make their own choice or failure. A 28-year-old does not know better than a 29-year-old. A 28-year-old in one day or an 18-year-old in one day does not know any better than a 17-year-old and sort of, you know, 364 days. And we are creating in law, in creating cases, that people are, are unequal in the law. And that is wrong. But also, let's not kill ourselves. We know that having a rolling educant is completely impractical and workable, and it will be got rid of. Let's be honest, we're not going to have a situation in 10, 20 years' time where a 34-year-old is going to be ID'd as a tobacconist or a news agent and say, oh, you look so 33, well, thank you very much for flattering me. <laughs> it's going to be banned outright. We know this. This is the thin end of the wedge. It creates inequality in the world law, it cuts down our freedoms, and fundamentally does make life that bit harder for everyone. Now, this place many years ago people described was a bastion of Puritanism. There were so many roundheads fighting the king many years ago in the Civil War. But I say once, there's too many roundheads at the moment in this parliament, too many naysayers, too many banning things. What we need is a few more cavaliers, a few people trying to enjoy bits of life and making those informed choices. For that reason, I oppose this bill, although it has got some good bits about vaping. What we should be doing is fighting the next, the next battle, which is against vapes, fully against vapes, rather than wasting our times fighting yesterday's battles. Yeah. Uh, Liz Twist. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to start with some figures from my local authority and uh, area and my constituency. Smoking prevalence is currently 9.9 per cent. That's 6,600 people in my constituency who are smoking. The total cost of smoking to the constituency is estimated at £73.2 million. Pounds. That's a productivity loss of £42 million, social care costs of £28 million, and health care costs of £2.9 million. The constituency spends £22.4 million on tobacco annually, and the average smoker spends £3,000 on tobacco a year. And across Gateshead, smoking in pregnancy in 22-23 is 10.9% compared to 8.8% nationally. The smoking rate amongst uh, adults in uh, different occupations showed that the more deprived areas uh, were smoking uh, more than those in, in other areas. As always, deprivation comes into these things. Lung cancer registrations for 2017 to 19, 688. And we know that smoking causes more than seven in 10 lung cancer cases. Smoking attributable hospital admissions, 2019 to 20, 2,707 in Gateshead. Emergency hospital admissions for COPD, uh, 825, and we know that smoking is a key determinant of COPD cases. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I welcome the measures in the Tobacco and Vapes Bill, which will take us one step closer to a smoke-free future. And I'm pleased to see that my party has pledged, pledged to support these efforts. Creating a smoke-free generation will radically level up the health and wealth of our nation, especially in regions like my own, the North East. Now, the North East has traditionally had higher prevalence uh, of smoking than the rest of the country, although we have made very significant gains through many efforts uh, in narrowing this gap. That, thanks to the, the tireless efforts of local councils and NHS trusts, uh, working together, not to mention FRESH, our brilliant regional tobacco control programme. But despite this progress, our communities still suffer terribly as a result of smoking. In Gateshead, where my constituency is based, as I said, there were over 2,700 smoking attributable hospital admissions in 2019 to 2020, and 825 emergency hospital admissions for COPD. Between 2017 and 2019, there were just over 1,000 deaths resulting from smoking in Gateshead alone. Ending smoking for the next generation will safeguard them from the suffering which has afflicted previous generations. 
However, we need to do much more to ensure that smokers in the most deprived groups are not left behind as we move towards a smoke-free uh, future. The disparity uh, between different groups is even more extreme for people within, within mental health conditions, with smoking rates as high as 26% for those with depression and anxiety, compared to 14% of the general population. And calculations by Action for Smoking and Health show that at the current rate of decline, smokers with a mental health condition will not achieve smoke-free status until after 2050, around 20 years later than those without a mental health condition. This bill is a major step in the right direction and will have a profound positive impact on the health and well-being of the next generation. But we must go further to tackle the health inequalities which continue to afflict, afflict the most disadvantaged in our communities. Yeah. Brendan Clark Smith. Yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy yeah, 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 Speaker, yeah, 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 yeah. I think I will start by saying that I, I believe this is a, a noble cause to try to encourage people to give up or to not take uh, smoking up in the first place. We know it's a very unhealthy habit, uh, it's very costly, and I do appreciate the good intentions that are behind this bill, and there are some things in it which I do agree with, but unfortunately it is something I cannot support, and I'm going to outline why now. And it is basically about trusting adults to make their own decisions in life and to choose their own approach. I believe that should be our approach. I believe there's been some very good contributions so far as to why uh, that should be. And of course, all societies do have rules. We have to live by those rules, but I believe these rules are unnecessary. And this legislation will not stop children from smoking per se. They're aimed at them once they reach their adult life. So it takes me back, I think, to when I was a a teenager and we remembered at a, a local supermarket, I think an elderly lady on one of the tills used to accept, um, I think seeing a set of car keys as an acceptable form of ID. <laughs> uh, and then unsurprisingly, a lot of my friends actually started to own a set of car keys many years before they actually owned cars at the time. But I think we all appreciate the importance of preventing underage sales and we need the robust enforcement of that and of course of the illegal tobacco trade which not only deprives the treasury of funds but can also put people at risk with some very dangerous products. And the same applies to vapes and I've been working with the authorities locally to clamp down on the places selling this. And I, I remember as a pupil and then as a teacher once upon a time it would be the pupils hiding behind the bike shed smoking and then after the ban came in from the staff rooms, it would normally be the teachers hiding behind there, <laughs> trying to uh, crash a cigarette. But uh, the Labour members opposite, they, they mention some of the um, bans that have come in in the past and some of the actions that they've taken, of course I'm old enough then to remember the time of the ban on tobacco advertising uh, when that came in and of course there was an exemption then for Formula One and we've spoke a lot about uh, <coughs> vested interests, of course uh, the boss of Formula One was a major Labour donor at the time and they did secure that exemption. I, I would ask them whether they believe um, it was right to take that cash or whether it was right to give that exemption or not. So I'd be very interested to, to hear the uh, Shadow Health Secretary's view on that later. But I, I take the point the member for Calder Valley said, would a, a cut-off date for all cigarettes or smoking be easier to enforce than this proposal that's here at the moment? And why is it that some adults should have less rights than other adults? And of course, we've got to also appreciate the, the role of vaping. And again, as has been pointed out, Sweden is a world leader with this. They're down to about 5.6% now. If you get down to 5%, you're classed as this smoke-free target. And yes, they've used things such as uh, snus, because that was outlawed throughout the rest of the European Union. They had special exemptions there. There is an opportunity, I believe, over the years that has been missed to use that to actually cut down on the number of smokers. But vaping has, of course, provided a highly effective alternative. But it's the principle that is at stake today. Uh, and that's what I'm going to really speak about, the principle of one group of adults having different rights to other sets of adults. Now, we can compare this over the years to the right to 18 or the Further Act in 1928 or going back to 1884 when only 40% of men, um, well, 40% of men, mainly the poorest in society, did not have the right to vote. 
later when it was extended to all men over 21. If you were a woman, you could only vote if you were over the age of 30 or if you or your husband had land with a rateable value of five pounds or more. And again, it wasn't until 1969 the voting age was lowered to 18. And I remember being elected as a young councillor in Nottingham at the age of 22. And it wasn't until, I believe, 2006 that that was changed to 18. So again, adults with different rights at the time. Uh, we've had people treated differently on the basis of their religion over the years, whether you were a Catholic or a Protestant in the 1600s, perhaps. We've seen the Race Relations Act in 1965, where we outlawed people being treated differently on the grounds of their colour, race, national origin. Uh, we then have had equal marriage, which we've just celebrated 10 years of, uh, and basically another example where adults are equal before the law to, to love who they wish, to marry who they wish. And I believe uh, this freedom is something that we are moving towards, and this is a good thing. It's about giving more rights and more equality and not actually restricting this. So the point here being the direction of travel has been about giving adults whatever their background to live their lives within the law as they wish, so long as they are not impinging on the rights of others. And this is the right direction and the right thing to do. And as Margaret Thatcher once said, when people are free to choose, they choose freedom. But what next? A ban on alcohol? A ban on takeaways? I would declare an interest in both of those. <laughs> And both of these are bad for us um, when they're not done responsibly. But we are adults, these are our choices, these are not the state's choice. Yeah. We need to get back to trusting adults to make their own decisions in life. I don't like banning things as a rule. And yes, there are always cases that you can make. I don't believe the case has been made here yet. We've already witnessed other nations dumping this idea, such as New Zealand. And the legislation, I believe, will not last the test of time in its current form. I believe it is unenforceable. Yep. But I absolutely support the intention to move towards a smoke-free generation. But I believe there is a better way. And it is for this reason that I'll be voting against this legislation. Yeah. Sir Simon Clark. Uh, it's a pleasure to be called in this debate, although I confess it is one which has depressed me because this is fundamentally illiberal legislation, oh, and yeah, if I yeah. am anything, and if, I, if, I, if I'm in the House for any reason, it is because I believe in liberalism, in the, in, in, the, in the ability of people to make better choices for themselves than can the state. And it does strike me that we are witnessing an encroaching tide yeah. whereby ever more of our liberties are, are taken away from us, and I, I think the speech gave, given by my right hon. friend, the member for Ross and Darwin, in this respect, was, was very good. We are fortunate in Britain to live in a country where we don't get our rights from the state. We have them inalienably from birth, and it's only those things which we proactively prescribe that we can't do. And we're adding more and more things to that list. I say that as someone who is totally clear. Smoking is a terrible idea. I wouldn't recommend it to any young person. I've spent a lot of time with uh, Dr Jonathan Ferguson at uh, James Cook Hospital in Middlesbrough. I've seen the pioneering work he's done on lung cancer. It is absolutely crystal clear that smoking damages your health, it damages your wealth. It is an antisocial habit in, in so many ways. But, and it is a big but, I don't believe it's my right to tell my fellow citizens that they can't do it. Any more than it's their right to tell me that I can't have a glass of red wine with, with dinner. These are not things which the state ought sensibly to be prescribing. I actually think that we have reached a relatively sensible point at this moment in time with regard to smoking legislation. I think not allowing it in public places where it can impinge on others is a very reasonable and sensible thing to do. And I don't think anyone would want to go back to the, uh, the, the situation uh, before the, uh, the 2006 legislation. What I would say, however, is that whether we have the right to smoke at all, in private, where we choose, is something which I think is up to us and not the state. I think that we risk creating a huge uh, philosophical as well as practical problem, uh, which will lead undoubtedly to further rights creep as the years go by, because it is likely that the health lobby 
uh, the interventionist lobby, as the Shadow Secretary of State put it in his speech, will use this as a logic which will allow them to move into other fields. Yeah. And what will our ability then be to resist that argument yeah. if we have conceded it here today? So I think there is a profound philosophical problem with it. I do also believe in practice it is going to be a nightmare <laughs> for shop workers up and down the country yeah. to be asked to enforce this. And I, I, I do think that it places them in a very invidious position, one which uh, is likely uh, to lead either to uh, them facing real trouble in their shops or to them, frankly, passing the buck and ignoring the law and making a mockery of it uh, existing <laughs> at all. Uh, I, I'll take a very brief intervention, mind for the other's uh, time. You know, on the, on the what next, I mean, when, when I was in office as public health minister, we brought in the sugar tax, the soft drinks industry levy, which encouraged industry through the sugar tax to reformulate drinks and took quite a lot of sugar out as a result because they followed that trend. If we were to reformulate processed food to take a lot of salt out and save a lot of lives from stroke, would that be a good or a bad thing? Well, I think it's, I think, I think that, that would arguably be perfectly sensible, but it's very different from a ban. I think the, the point here is about the degree of harm. I, I, I strongly support the ban on uh, uh, Ill illegal drugs, but I, I do so because cocaine and heroin and the like wreck lives, they destroy communities. Tobacco does not do that, but we already have enough difficulty enforcing the existing bans that we have in place. Those already stretch our resources to the utmost, and frankly, as we all know, we all too often fail to enforce those bans. So adding a new ban risks creating something which will be unworkable from the outset, while creating a huge black market in which criminal enterprise will thrive. Meanwhile, the state will have forgone the tax revenue, some 10 or 11 billion pounds a year, that is then ploughed back into our public services, including the health service, to combat the effects of smoking. That revenue simply won't be there anymore. So we will likely still have people smoking, but we'll have offset many of the, uh, the, the revenue streams which allow us to combat it. I simply don't understand how it is that a Conservative Prime Minister has thought it was appropriate to bring forward legislation which seems to me is the opposite of the reason why we in this House are sent here, which is to defend and hold the principle of individual choice and individual liberty. <coughs> Where this legislation has been introduced, as we've heard, it has already been repealed, as in New Zealand. I fear that in this country we will face a choice in the years ahead. Either between eventual repeal because it doesn't work, or, as my honourable friend from Mother Valley said, towards an outright ban, because the sheer unworkability of trying to ascertain whether the person in front of you in the queue is aged 40 or 39 will in practice be unworkable, and we will simply see a Labour government, left doubtless, move to an outright ban uh, in, in terms of just making the situation simpler, tidier, neater. That would be, I think, a, a, real red, a real red line. But we, as I say, will have forgone the ability to make the principal case against it. I will give way. To my right honourable friend for giving way, he says that drugs destroy lives, but tobacco doesn't. What about the people who are dying from emphysema and long-term lung cancer disease? There are many families in the United Kingdom who are seeing their relatives die a long, lingering death as a result of using tobacco. With respect to my honourable friend, I said that uh, these drugs destroy communities, and there's a very profound difference here. The, the ripple effect of illegal drugs is to prompt real social harm to others, because obviously these habits are so destructive that people steal uh, and rob in order to, to fund them. Tobacco does not do that. It is obviously extremely bad for you, but it does not drive patterns of behaviour as destructive as those associated with crime. That is a fundamental difference. It's why I think we should focus our efforts on stopping those trades rather than on banning something which has been legal for hundreds of years, which we all recognise carries with it real medical harms, but which it is not, I submit, our job to try and take away from people. We should rely on education, we should rely on the tax system, but we should not rely on legislation to tell other people what to do when they're grown adults in a free country. Dr Caroline Johnson. I rise in support of the Government's Bill uh, today. Um, one of the first speakers this afternoon was my honourable friend, the member for Bosworth, who talked about his first job in respiratory medicine. Indeed, my first job as a doctor was in adult respiratory medicine too. 
And I spent a lot of time looking after patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in terms of claudication as well, uh, lung cancer. And what that taught me is that smoking doesn't just cause premature death, it causes quite substantial, debilitating, miserable disability that can go on for many, many years. And so I support the government in doing all it can to reduce the number of smokers. Some people have talked today about freedom, the freedom as an adult to choose to do what you want to do. But we already make changes to what adults can do. We already restrict their freedoms. For example, we tell adults they must put a seatbelt on when they get in the car. They must wear a helmet when they ride a motorcycle. They cannot drink alcohol before they get in a car. They cannot drive down the motorway at 150 miles an hour. So we already make restrictions for safety of people uh, on that basis. I do think that gradually increasing the age is, is, in, is inelegant, as the, the Select Committee Chair put it earlier on. And I do think that it will be challenging to enforce it. But one, the alternative would be to ban it outright. And that is very difficult to do because it's an addictive substance. If you ban an addictive substance overnight, you are criminalising those who are already addicted. Whereas by doing it in advance and gradually increasing the age groups. By doing it in advance and gradually increasing the age groups, you instead are able to um, uh, not criminalise people for being addicted because they didn't get addicted in the first place, at least in principle. Um, but I want to focus most of my remarks uh, in the time I have on vaping. I've been campaigning on the issue of vaping for some time now um, because I've been very concerned about the number of children, snowballing numbers of children, uh, being uh, very addicted to it and indeed brought a 10 minute rule bill through last year uh, to try and ban disposables because they've been the most attractive to children and provide the most environmental damage. At the time I did that, there were 1.3 million vapes being used uh, a week. It's now up to 5 million. Uh, they're almost impossible to recycle in practice because their lithium batteries are difficult to recycle uh, and the nicotine uh, sh uh, gets soaked into the plastic, which makes the plastic uh, difficult to recycle too. I do understand the need for adults to have... Um, something to stop smoking. But what this is, is not just a stop smoking device. We should look at it as an alternative addiction. Uh, and I spoke to the um, industry earlier on in my uh, campaigning. And I said to them, what is it with all these flavours? And they said to me, well, the thing is, if someone starts stop smoking using nicotine gum, what they do is they use the, the nicotine gum or something as a, as a stop smoking device. So they go from smoking to gum to nothing. If we give them vapes that taste of tobacco or are bland, then what happens is they go from smoking to vaping to nothing. If we give them cherry cola flavoured vapes, they go from smoking to vaping cherry cola to vaping mango to vaping blueberry. And they remain one of our customers and they continue to use our product. So what they're doing is they're trying to create a new generation of adults to make them billions of pounds. And I can understand why they want to make the money, but the way they're doing it is, in my view, immoral. And in particular, the way they're marketing these things at children is immoral because a grown-up may wish, perhaps, to have a cherry cola flavoured vape, but he or she does not need to have a unicorn milkshake flavoured cherry vape, so it's <laughs> shaped like SpongeBob SquarePants. Um, and that's why the flavours are important, and I welcome the government's uh, measures to deal with flavours, colours, shapes and packaging. What are the risks of vaping? Education is really important on this, and others have talked about this. In the short term for our children, it causes problems with concentration. It causes a powerful addiction that causes children to have to leave lessons because they can't cope the end of a double lesson without vaping. And in some cases, as we've heard, it causes chest symptoms and can cause collapse. In the long term, the simple answer is we just don't know. A recent UCL study showed that DNA methylation, i.e. modification of DNA, occurs in people who vape. Now, does that show that it causes cancer? No, it doesn't. Time is going to tell us that, but it at least suggests that it might. And that is why we must be extremely careful uh, with our children. Children will always experiment, adolescents will always experiment. With, um, with substances, because that's the nature of adolescence, experimenting against boundaries. But we need to make sure that we take as much care of them as we possibly can. Um, I'd like to particularly welcome Clause 10. This allows extension to other nicotine products, because this industry is making millions and billions of pounds, right? And they're going to continue to flex to try and keep people addicted to nicotine, in my opinion. And we can see that today. T uh, a search today on the internet showed that Tesco are selling nicotine pouches £6.50 for 20 
These are little tiny pouches of nicotine, up to 12 milligrams. It's about 10 packets of cigarettes, sorry, 10 cigarettes, that you stick under your gum and releases that 10, 10 cigarettes of nicotine over an hour. They sell them in flavours of ice cool, bergamot, wildberry, mocha, elderflower. Do you see a pattern here? This is, this is going to be the next thing, and that's why I welcome the government's um, clause, which allows it to flex into new forms of nicotine use if it wants to. Um, I do have some questions from Minister, though. The, ment the, sorry, the Health Act of 2006 prevents smoking in enclosed public spaces and on public transport in certain other areas. I um, asked the Minister why um, that has not been extended to um, vaping as well. Also, as I was walking through Westminster the other day, I saw a bus, a big TfL red bus, something I've written to Mr. Sadiq Khan about before, <laughs> advertising vaping. And I'm wondering whether the government plans to extend vaping uh, regulations not just to the packaging and what the package looks like, but whether um, it's willing to extend it to the advertising as well, uh, is itself. I won't give away because I've only got a minute. Um, and um, Donald Member for York said earlier on about... Um, the advertising at Blackburn Rovers, and again, sports advertising, children watching, I don't think that's very helpful. Uh, and then my final question for the Minister will be, given that this is really urgent, given that we are seeing so many children starting vaping, uh, and we want to stop people smoking as soon as possible, why are we waiting to bring these regulations in? Why not bring them in to affect children more quickly? Thank you. Giles Watley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, and I'd like to say that, uh, like my uh, honourable friend from Windsor, um, I was a smoker uh, for many a year, and I gave up some 30 years ago, and it was, as I said earlier, in an intervention, one of the hardest things I ever did. And uh, I wish to God uh, that uh, vaping had been available to me then to help me off what would now be a £45 a day habit. Um, so I slightly disagree that people do steal to support such a habit, I imagine, as it is extraordinarily expensive. And banning things, as we all know, tends to drive things underground. And nobody today, as far as I've heard, has mentioned the prohibition of alcohol in America. And look what that led to. Now, I consider myself a libertarian conservative, and I think the best government is one that, that, that interferes in the market least and only spends our taxpayers' money when we really need to. And, as always, the growth of the state is something little more than good news for bureaucrats. No one, no one in Clacton has ever looked at issues locally and told me that the solution was new taxes and overly convoluted legislation. However, this isn't about dogma. It is about practicality, not about ideology, but about pragmatism, science and economics. There are a number of measures in the bill which I feel I can support. The banning of disposable vape, vapes seems timely, given the ecological damage they cause going to landfill and strewn across our streets in countless millions. Uh, re revisiting the legal age of vaping and smoking seems to be a logical response to the worrying fact of underage people navigating their way to go towards addiction through these vapes. And I'm pleased that the government has listened to me on the subject of nicotine pouches just mentioned by my honourable friend. However, let's consider what the science of public health and the recent economic facts have taught us. Vapes are cheap, available and attractive to many. And that's why smoking has dramatically in decreased. The recent tax on vape liquid may well be regressive if vaping costs starts to gain parity with normal cigarettes. The free market has done its job and given the public a cheaper and healthier alternative. And I'd be deeply worried about the unintended consequences of monkeying around with that. I feel we also need to step out of this space and consider what actually works on the ground. No one currently needs a license from their local authority to sell vapes or nicotine products. This means that trading standards teams are often a skeleton crew. And yet, do we think a complex and incremental age-increasing ban is enforceable with such weak enforcement. It isn't. Yeah, yeah. I certainly don't buy the argument that you pay for expanded teams via increased fines. You don't increase the headcount of staff based on speculative and one-off cash injections from fines. Right. If we want to clamp down on the very real issue of illegal cigarettes and underage sale of cigarettes and vapes, then we need a licensing scheme, in my view, yeah, which yeah. properly funds trading standards teams and rewarding those responsible business owners and going after the villains. Now, I could support 
a ban on selling these products to those under 21 or under 18 or whatever. The gunnable, gu, the gu, I, this could hit the government's laudable goal of killing, killing off underage consumption by getting the sale out of teenage years entirely. That is simple and impactful. This, in my mind, is preferable to a law which puts the shopkeeper in the firing line for having to interrogate people in line, yeah. turfing out the 22-year-old whilst questioning the 24-year-old and supplying the 25-year-old. This is clearly nuts. I've spoken to retailers in Clacton, and the generational nature of the ban is frankly quite frightening for many. It seems like a charter for confusion and confrontation to many, and it also might criminalise people inadvertently. So I'm going to be very quick here, and I want to conclude. There is a way forward here. There are bold steps we can take with underage addictions and not damaging the health advancements the free market has allowed, to, allowed us to make. And I believe that licensing is the answer. Thank you. Uh, Chloe Smith. Thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy Speaker. Fifteen years of experience here leading and scrutinising complicated legislation tells me to be cautious with this bill. I admire its aims very strongly, but I have some questions set to set out as to whether it will work. With direct knowledge of cancer and deep commitment to cancer awareness, I want people to smoke less. Smoking causes, as we've heard, around one in four of all UK cancer deaths. Tobacco, especially cigarette smoking, is the single most important and, as we've heard, preventable cause of ill health, disability and death in this country. I agree with the Bill's hope of reducing that suffering. I also desire the Bill's aim to realise an economic saving on healthcare, named as over three billion, in the impact assessment and a productivity gain of 24 billion over 30 years. My honourable friend, the chair of the select committee, is right that we should be looking, taking the long-term view here and looking for the gains uh, from prevention. But for all of that to be possible, Madam Deputy Speaker, the legislation has to work. And I'm joining today's debate, and I shall keep it concise, Madam Deputy Speaker, because I care very much about politics and about democracy working. As I stand down from Parliament this year, this is one of the final pieces of draft legislation for me, and it's a significant proposition. So I just raised some points that are all intended to be thoughtful and based on five terms of constituency work and ministerial experience in six departments. In one of my past roles, I had to undo legislation that I had helped to implement because it didn't work. The age of sale mechanism in this bill is the untested thing. It would be the first of its kind in the world, but that accolade is only because a few have tried and failed to carry support. The whole bill, or the bill as a whole, uh, has an imperfect evidence base. That's clear throughout the bill's analysis, particularly because we don't yet have the full data picture about the effects of vaping. So what's in front of us today is inherently risky and theoretical. I think it is also possible that it may be divisive by asking one group of adults to live under different rules than another. I understand that the Malaysian equivalent was challenged on equality grounds, and I'd be really interested to know what lessons the minister has drawn from there. I think it is also legitimate to be worried that something so novel may be unfair on retailers. The British Independent Retailers Association in particular points out that the quite sophisticated enforcement needs of this mechanism falls on their members. As the Association of Convenience Stores adds, and I quote here, proxy purchasing of any age restricted products is extremely difficult for retailers to detect and prevent. And indeed, the deterrent in this bill for proxy purchasing is just £50 if caught and paid promptly. And now that is, after my right honourable friend, the Chancellor's efforts at the latest budget, that is actually only the cost of about three or four packets of cigarettes. So, I'm concerned that the design of the proxy buying deterrence in this bill could be fatally impractical, actually, for what is trying to be achieved. And let's just put that in really super practical terms. Your friend, a year older than you, uh, may well be able to go into the shop or indeed online, get two packets, let you have one, and actually the cost of doing so in the end adds up to only three or four packets uh, to themselves. That is something we ought to give um, considerable thought to. Going on, the British Retail Consortium says that a better policy is needed on ID in this bill, and I do 
agree with that point. I was surprised to see that the impact assessment says nothing about the impact of individuals needing to provide ID throughout their life instead of just up to the age of adulthood. Now, the document, of course, does deal in the costs to retailers of checking ID, but it is silent on the burden of asking a particular group of adults to have to prove their date of birth for life. I'm talking about those who are or who look and who would continue to be or to look just above the age that is stated in the bill. Healthy or unhealthy, right or wrong, they have every right to buy cigarettes and would remain with, uh, in possession of that right, but they'd have to prove it for life under this bill. When I led the Elections Act 2022 through this chamber, we were quite rightly questioned very hard on the nature of asking adults to bring identification to a polling station. We acknowledged up front that not everybody holds a driving licence or a passport, and we made sure that other forms of ID were available, given the importance of one's democratic rights. Now, in retail, it's a slightly different point. I'm not making a, a direct comparison. But free ID is already available. I'm thinking of the citizen card, for example. But it does need to be renew renewed every few years. And it is a new requir requirement created by this bill that it would need to be used for life. And I think the government ought to have more reassurances than silence to give to those law-abiding people. Madam Deputy Speaker, I said I strongly admire the aspiration of the bill. And for the sake of all those who are entangled in a lethal addiction, I would like to see smoking stop in this country. I'm not standing here on ideological grounds. I'm making sensible points about whether it is going to work. We've had, quite rightly, a wide-ranging, reflective, constructive debate. Good intentions and heroic ambition is not enough. If we are going to do something very novel and use the power of legislation to do so, we need to have sufficient confidence that it's workable. So I do hope that fellow legislators will rise to the challenges that are presented by this idea and scrutinise it very carefully. Uh, Gareth Johns. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There's actually um, quite a, an amount of agreement in this House uh, about what we're trying to achieve here. Nobody is suggesting that smoking is anything other than very bad for your health. Nobody is suggesting that we should be encourage anybody to smoke. Uh, and we know that there are specific dangers uh, to children. Um, so there is a common ground, a common goal, if you like, as to where we want to end up with this piece of legislation. However, I believe that the generational ban is the, completely the wrong approach. Um, th th there is a general assumption in this House that we ensure that laws apply equally to all adults. And this piece of legislation turns that general assumption completely on its head and creates this bizarre, absurd situation where you will get people within a year of it, or they of each other, in fact, uh, unable to have the same rights as someone a day older than them. And no other country in the world has implemented this. Um, many countries have looked at it. New Zealand's been mentioned, Malaysia's been mentioned, Australia's been mentioned. Um, and every other country in the world has come to the conclusion that they're not going to implement it. So either they've all got it wrong and we've got it right, or that's not the case. I doubt that that is the case. And it is a classic case of a kind of nanny knows best approach to politics, which is incredibly patronising to adults and will be increasingly patronising. It is, as I say, a very absurd piece of legislation. It has actually one absurdity, which hasn't really been mentioned in this house before, but the snuff box that we've got out there by the, uh, key, the doorkeeper's, the, the principal doorkeeper's uh, chair. He pays for that snuff for members of parliament who wish to partake in, that, in taking snuff. Right, right. And in the future, Madam Deputy Speaker, any MP who comes into this House, who's currently 15 years of age or younger, won't be able to have it. In fact, the doorkeeper, the doorkeeper will be committing a criminal offence if they provide snuff to that Member of Parliament. These are the absurdities that are being created by this piece of legislation. Because, actually, this bill is not the way to reduce smoking rates. We all want to reduce smoking rates, and this bill is not the way to do it. The way to do it is through education and providing alternatives such as vapes.
The swap to shop, a swap to stop programme that was implemented by the government was a brilliant scheme. Thousands of people have given up smoking as a consequence of that scheme. And many other initiatives that the government has brought in have been tremendous in helping smokers to quit. And I pay tribute to uh, the government for all of those achievements. Um, if you look, though, at specific countries, the, it's a shame the member for Calder Valley is not actually in uh, his place because he mentioned Sweden. And actually, if you look at Sweden, because they have been enthusiastic about allowing people to have alternatives to tobacco, they currently have the lowest rate of smoking in the world. And not just that, they have the lowest rate of lung cancer in the world. And it's not a coincidence that it's Sweden that has the lowest rate. It is because they have embraced alternatives to tobacco. And whilst I accept that there are difficulties in having comparisons between different countries, when you look at Turkey and Indonesia, whose smoking rates are increasing, they are also two of the countries that have completely banned vaping. The Secretary of State, quite rightly in her opening speech, mentioned Australia and how the smoking rate amongst young people in Australia is currently going up. In Australia, vapes are banned. And that is not a coincidence either. Vaping helps adult smokers to quit, and thereby it saves lives. And so we do all want the same thing. We do want less smokers. And in order to achieve that, we need to ensure that the legislation that we have is flexible. I'm very grateful to the Secretary of State for agreeing that a consultation will take place on the flavourings. I think that is very, very important. I was going to table an amendment to make sure that was happening. There's no necessity to do that now because of her commitment to the House. Flavours are important because what often happens with smokers when they give up smoking and they start vaping instead, a couple of weeks down the line, they get a bit fed up with the vaping that they're carrying out. And so they either go back to tobacco or they switch to a different flavour. And therefore, having a variety of flavours is very important. I totally concede that having zingy bubblegum flavour vape is, is, is wrong. We should not have any kind of marketing that makes it attractive to children. But what we should have is a choice for adult smokers who wish to switch to vaping. Because we have actually two types of vaping going on in this country at the moment. We have the vaping that's being carried out by smokers who want to stop smoking and they're vaping as a substitute for the tobacco they previously were consuming. And there is also that other kind of vaping which is children using it for fun. We need to tackle that robustly. But what we don't need to do is to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Madam Deputy Speaker, vaping, when carried out by an adult, saves lives. It relieves burden on the NHS. If you care about the NHS, and I'm sure everybody in this chamber does, then allowing for vaping to take place as an alternative to smoking must be the right way. There is a danger that this House, though, could send out a perception that vaping is just as bad as tobacco, and if it does that, then many people will think, well, what's the point in vaping? I might as well smoke instead, if they are as bad as each other. They are not as bad as each other. Um, vaping is considerably safe, more safe than uh, consuming tobacco, although we do not want children who are non-smokers from taking that up. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Ailey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is quite basic for me. I see the tobacco and vapes bill as an opportunity to change the life chances and the life course of thousands of children in the Stroud district and my two little girls in that mix. It is not perfect, but it enhances the chance for their little lungs and healthy bodies to grow up to be strong adults. And like many, I am intuitively against banning things and state interventions. I have concerns about the implementations, the practicalities and the enforcement, but I am less interested in hearing slagging off colleagues to help sell books and more interested in the really spirited debate that we have had and challenges from right honourable members like Norwich North because I think the amendments that could potentially come and the debates that are coming on this will help us. Because 
At the heart of this legislation is this great parliament using the knowledge and evidence that has built up over decades and decades that tobacco causes harm. When we know that smoking cigarettes is addictive, it's expensive and it limits life chances, particularly of the poorest, why would you accept the status quo and hope for a natural evolution? When we know that smoking impacts life opportunities and youngsters are still smoking despite everything that we have done so far and those awful pictures on the boxes. When we know all of that, why would we not want to do more? And secondly, to the health of the nation, the NHS clearly needs reform. I know politicians get shot down in flames for that, but that is the reality. The combination of an ageing population and the billions provided in taxpayers' cash year after year, never ever being enough, mean that serious change is required. So notwithstanding my concerns about this legislation, I do view this bill and the measures to be part of a genuinely bold and preventative strategy that we have not seen before. This is also from a Prime Minister who is known to be characteristically thoughtful into the detail, into the data, into the evidence. So I applaud the PM for being willing to take a battering on this, to try and do the right thing and to prevent known harms for children and for young people's futures. Children in Stroud and Gloucestershire and beyond will benefit from this bill as they are growing up. Now all six Gloucestershire MPs have the absolute joy and benefit of meeting with our health experts on a regular basis. Now they give us a hard time, we give them a hard time, they're very rarely really happy with the government on all bases, but they told us that this policy is one of the most important public health interventions that any government can make. They then wrote to us to say that the health, health, health experts wholeheartedly support the plan to create a smoke-free generation. They said that the legislation is needed and proportionate. Smoking is the leading cause of preventable ill health and death and the major driver of differences between the rich and the poor. In Gloucestershire, the smoking prevalence of the most deprived quintile of the county is 22% and as many as over 30% of those in routine and manual employment 25,000 people in our little county. Furthermore, smoking is the leading cause of the 10 to 20 year reduction in life expectancy in people with serious mental health illness, of whom 38% of those in our county are addicted to tobacco. Now, progression towards a smoke-free future, the doctors say, will significantly improve the health and well-being of those currently in the most adverse circumstances, with nearly 26,000 people, uh, tobacco-dependent households in our county. And a note to the self-proclaimed freedom fighters, we all love freedom, but addicts are not free. They have very limited choices too. Two-thirds of those who try smoking will go on to continue to smoke for the rest of their lives. That was my bit, by the way, the Freedom Fighter. That was not our learned doctors. But the doctors did say <laughs> that the legislation have the potential to avoid 4,653 hospital admissions and 690 premature deaths in Gloucestershire, which occur as a result of smoking. They said that while this is a novel po policy, Madam Deputy Speaker, there is no reason to think it cannot be successfully implemented. And I do not accept that the UK cannot do this. The legislation will have a profound impact on society as transformative as smoke-free legislation did more than a decade ago. It is possible to conceive a future where smoking no longer addicts and kills thousands of people every year. I'd like to thank Dr Charlie Sharp, Deborah Lee, our former chief exec, Dr Richard Makins, Shima Raymond and Professor Mark Pietroni amongst many others that gave me the most structured and sensible part of my speech because they know, they see this stuff every day, my mum's a nurse, they see it. We can do this, let's not talk this parliament and this country down in terms of implementing tricky things and I'm looking Looking forward to the next stages. Yeah. Matt Warman. My dad used to smoke 60 John Player specials a day. When he, when he died in 2009, the last 20 years of his life had been blighted by heart attacks, by strokes, by dementia, by things that we know now and we knew then are exacerbated not by free human jo choice, but exacerbated by the fact that smoking is an, addi an addiction. Nobody chooses to smoke 60 cigarettes a day. Addiction forces them to, and it hits the poorest hardest. Tobacco ruins lives. 
Smoking takes away the rational, free human choices that so many people in this chamber have defended today. Defending smoking is not defending rational, free human choices. It's defending addiction, the very opposite. And every day, Madam Deputy Speaker, when we come to this place, I think we should ask ourselves one question. How can I, as a Member of Parliament, how can we, as a Parliament, how can the government do things that make the lives of our constituents better, healthier, happier, freer? And most of the time, Madam Deputy Speaker, I think Parliament, government should get out of the way. Absolutely I do. There are even days when I think uh, the things that we can do most is to not even say anything. But we do have to ask ourselves, what are the things that government can do? Because there are some things that only government can do. Uh, the Ronald Reagan quote that the most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll, I'll let you into a secret. It was a joke. Ronald Reagan was being slightly glib when he said that. And the real most terrifying words in the English language might perhaps be that there is no government, that there is no operation existing above our individual choices to protect us, to give us security, to fulfil the single most important function of government, security. And security in terms of health is just as important, Madam Deputy Speaker, because the government exists to make people's lives happier and healthier. You might think that governments are a necessary evil, apparently, or you might think that they're a brilliant thing that can expand ever greater. But whatever, we don't improve people's lives by getting out of the way all the time. Tobacco doesn't have some unique special status. We should ask ourselves why, as a parliament, have we agreed that, uh, that uh, it is right to have speed limits, it is right to have seat belts, it is right to have motorcycle helmets, and yet somehow people make a different argument for tobacco. That just doesn't make sense. Now, some people will say that this bill isn't perfect and, and they're right because nothing is, but you do have to, I think, if you vote against this bill or even if you abstain on it, you have to demonstrate that it makes the current situation worse. And I can't see a single example of where it does. You might say that it makes some uh, shops unviable. Well, if the viability of your business depends on tobacco, I don't think that it's good for this country if you are a viable business. Some will say that it fuels the black market. That doesn't seem to be an argument to me at all. We don't make crime legal for fear of driving it underground. We in the Conservative Party put 20,000 extra police officers on the streets. <laughs> you fund what we need to do to tackle it. And some have said, many have said, that it is about a 34-year-old coming into a shop and being told, I'm terribly sorry you're not 35. The reality of this, this approach and why it is the right approach is because by the time today's 14, 15, 16-year-olds are 34, 35, it simply won't be viable for those shops to be selling tobacco. It is a way of driving something out of our society and it is a way of driving a bad thing out of our society. That can only be a good thing. So. Madam Deputy Speaker, an addicted life is not a free life. The spurious grounds to object to this bill have not, in my judgment, demonstrated that they do what needs to be done and demonstrate that voting for this bill makes it worse. The social contract that gives us in this place legitimacy is a balance. We've done some things recently that have tested that balance, and today we have a chance to show people that the 60-something percent of people who support this legislation, that we're on their side. Government shouldn't always be allergic to doing things that are popular. Because when push comes to shove, yes, people love freedom, of course they love freedom, but what people need to exercise that freedom is to be alive. So I come back, Madam Deputy Speaker, to where I started, to my dad. The last 20 years of his life exacerbated by smoking, strokes, heart attacks, dementia. That wasn't a free life. It was a life destroyed by addiction for precious little pleasure and a lot of money. We need the freedom to live longer, healthier, happier lives. Fewer people dying needlessly. That's what this bill can do for us today. I can't understand why you'd vote against it. I can't understand why you'd be indifferent to it. What we should do, surely, 
is answer the question in front of us as best we can. And I can't help but think that if you're voting against this today, you can't see the human wood for the ideological trees. It's an answer that we've got. For all the high-flown arguments about the nanny state, the beginning and the end of this debate should be very, very simple. It is, will people live longer, healthier, happier lives? Will they be alive? It will deliver that. I commend it to the House. Maggie through. And as a former public health minister and currently vice president of the parliamentary group on smoking and health, mm. I'm delighted to be speaking in this landmark debate today and to be supporting the measures in this legislation. And today the UK takes another significant step towards becoming smoke free, which will safeguard the health and well-being of millions of people across the country from the threat of smoking related diseases. I'd like to begin my remarks by taking members back over 60 years to 1962. Not that many of us can remember that, uh, but it, was, it marked the beginning of this marathon debate. This was the time when leading political figures such as Harold Wilson and Tony Benn openly smoked whilst giving interviews. Your doctor's cigarette of choice, or so we were told, was the camel. And a young American actor who's just been mentioned by, by my honourable friend, Fert Boston, who was going by the name of Ronald Reagan, appeared on glossy ads to encourage people to send special Christmas cartons of Chesterfields to all their friends instead of traditional card. 1962 was also the year when the UK relationships with smoking changed. A crucial report published by the Royal College of Physicians shed light on the devastating consequences of smoking and urgently called for the government to tackle smoking. This seminal report paved the way for numerous groundbreaking reforms, including health warnings on PACs and the ban of smoking in public places. And government policy to tackle the rise of smoking over more recent years has largely focused on increasing the duty on tobacco. However, while a packet of 20 king-size cigarettes may have risen from £1.68 in 1990 to around £17 in 2024, taxation alone has not solved the problem, with 12.9% of the population still continuing to smoke, and that percentage in my constituency of Arrowwash is 14%. The impetus for the government to act now through new legislation to create a smoke-free generation cannot be clearer. Smoking is the UK's single biggest prevention, preventable killer. It causes 15 different types of cancer. It's linked to cardiovascular disease, strokes, diabetes and dementia, as well as reducing the life expectancy of by an estimated eight years for those living in Derbyshire. Smoking puts huge pressure on the NHS, with someone admitted to hospital with a smoking-related condition almost every minute in England resulting in 400,000 admissions every year. Tobacco use costs billions of pounds in England in lost productivity and health and social care costs. Within my own constituency of Arrowwash, Ash estimates that the total cost of smoking, including productivity loss, social care costs and health costs, is £91.8 million. The Tobacco and Vapes Bill represents a bold and necessary response to this public health crisis and is a direct result of Javid Khan's review carried out whilst I was Public Health Minister. The measures proposed by Khan will without doubt save tens of thousands of lives and the health system billions of pounds and it will save an entire generation from a smoking and tobacco addiction, including in Arrowwash. As was alluded to by my own friend Men for, for Boston, we all entered this place, regardless of party politics, with the honourable intention of making life better for the people we represent. I recently met with students from Dovedale Primary School in my constituency, during which we discussed the idea of increasing the age of sale of tobacco by one year every year. The students unanimously backed this measure. By supporting this legislation and ensuring that children turning 15 or younger this year, including all those of the Dovedale Primary School students, will never legally be sold cigarettes, we have a golden opportunity to deliver on that promise of making life better for our constituents. And if we do not, then how can we ever go into schools in our constituencies again and look those children and young people in the eye? 
Another objection put forward by critics of this bill and tobacco manufacturers is that the cost of smoking to public finances is far less than tobacco tax revenues. This is just not the case. Lost productivity, healthcare costs and social care expenditures paint a stark picture of the true cost of smoking to public finances. Calculations by Ash estimated that in 2019, lost productivity due to smoking in England cost £14 billion, in addition to £3 billion costs to the NHS and social care. Tobacco excise, rev excise tax revenues for the whole of the UK in 2019 were under £9 billion. The financial burden imposed by smoking far outweighs any tax revenues gained from tobacco sales. And moving on to other aspects of the bill, as I've already mentioned, the Calm Review outlined that vaping is an effective tool to help people quit smoking. Whilst I agree with this analysis, many young people are being given these products containing nicotine and are becoming addicted. This is, this is all down to clever ploy by tobacco, tobacco manufacturers. Today the vaping industry is applying similar tactics to those used by Big Tobacco in 1962. Vapes are increasingly being marketed as fashion accessories and this bill will tackle this directly by regulating the packaging of vaping and nic nicotine products and also will reduce the appeal and attractiveness of vaping and nicotine products to children and young people. But can the Minister confirm whether the Government has considered a total ban of sale of tobacco and vaping products within a defined radius of schools? I'm sure this will have a huge impact as well. The final point I would like to make is on the illicit vaping market. Our efforts to combat smoking and vaping must also extend beyond the legal market to tackle this side of things. We've all heard stories about criminal gangs exploiting the market and selling vapes containing synthetic spice. And just last week, the King's College London study published an, um, a, a report by Dr. Karan Cope Copeland that outlined the fact that so-called zombie drugs have been found in fake uh, vapes. So once again, can I ask the Minister what she's doing to tackle this dangerous aspect of the vaping market? To conclude, this is our 1962 moment. We as parliamentarians have an opportunity to end smoking once and for all, ensuring future generations are protected. Some may argue now is not a time to legislate on this matter. I say, if not now, when? The Tobacco and Vapes Bill is the single biggest public health intervention in a generation and 66% of adults across Great Britain already support this legislation. Now is the time for colleagues from across the House to back this bill for the sake of public health, the economy and our NHS. Yeah. Thank you, Madam <laughs> This position, and as with most things in life, the more time we spend doing a job, the better we get at it. I feel that is true in this place, and I hope the whips sat on the front bench will agree. <laughs> How I have looked, <laughs> my understanding of what it is to be a legislator has been a steep le learning curve. However, I have looked at policy has changed over my time here. I have concluded for now that as an MP who is guided by his Christian faith, that I should apply to all policies three simple tests. They are, is it conservative? Is it needed? And is it enforceable? I applied these tests to this bill. Is it conservative? On this first test, sadly I think not. I understand banning drugs. I understand banning drinking and driving. I understand banning smoking in pubs. But to ban a legal product from someone born in 2009, but not for someone born in 2008, seems a little too far overreaching for me. It is also creating that nanny state I and many others speak about. This has so many implications. Where does it end? Obesity is killing as many people as smoking. So are we to ban McDonald's, KFC, Dunkin' Donuts, chocolate? Alcohol is another killer. Do we ban that too? Driving accidents. Do we ban motorbikes, fast cars? Fires, do we ban candles? What about Scotland's law on supposed hate speech? Someone's words offend, so we ban free speech. So on the first test, is it conservative? Sadly, I think not. Next test is, is it needed? I believe the Prime Minister's intentions are honourable. 
Smoking kills so many people many years before their time, often a slow, painful death. I am campaigning hard for a new hospital in Doncaster, therefore I visit the RI infirmary fairly often. On one of the saddest sites is seeing patients stood outside the hospital, often in their dressing gowns, in all weathers, smoking. It's a bizarre sight. There to get better, yet sadly killing themselves at the same time. And I'm sure this is replicated across the country. Smoking is not a nice habit. It costs a fortune, it results in bad breath, clothes that stink, yellow teeth, yellow fingers. I know at one time many thought it was fashionable to smoke. I know we are all clear now it is not. So is this bill needed? Let us just say I can understand why many think it is. Thirdly, is it enforceable? Another difficulty with the bill. I often say here we are quick to make legislation. How often, however, often the problem is we are simply not enforcing the legislation we already have in place. Many of our streets have issues with the use of banned substances and illegal activities. The use of cannabis is often ignored, even though we can smell it on many streets. Prostitution, again illegal, but often ignored. Quad bikes on our streets, maybe not ignored, but often so difficult to deal with. So are we going to spend time prosecuting shop assistants for selling cigarettes to a 35 year old when their 36 year old friends can still buy them? I think not. I understand the hope that by then the 35 year old will not want to smoke. But like most things, when something is banned, an unregulated black market is created, often turning law-abiding citizens into criminals. Never a good thing to do. So as far as my three tests go, this legislation only really passes one. This b bill, therefore, is a struggle for me to support. I also want to go back to my first point. Is it conservative? And more importantly, is it more evidence of the creation of that nanny state? I believe so. If we take more and more decisions away from adults, then more adults will continue to rely more and more on the state to make decisions for them. This is not a good thing. And sadly, it will only create only more powerful governments and weaker individuals. This thought reminded me of a video I watched recently, and I want to read what the gentleman said. His words, not mine. He said, My grandfather walked 10 miles to work every day. My father walked five. I'm driving a Cadillac. My son is in a Mercedes. He said, My grandson will be in a Ferrari. But he said, My great grandson will be walking again. I asked him why, why is that? And he said to me, tough times create strong people. Strong people create easy times. Easy times create weak people. Weak people create tough times. Many will not understand, but we have to raise warriors. Nanny states do not raise warriors. They create weak individuals. And as the man said, weak individuals create tough times. I want a society to help raise warriors, as I believe going forward we are going to need as many as we can find, smokers or not. Just finally, is it Christian to support or not support this bill? I am sure there are arguments on both sides. But we start each day in this place saying the Lord's Prayer. We ask our Lord, lead me not into temptation. We do not ask him to take temptation away. No, I think our Lord wants us to be warriors too, to be able to withstand the many temptations this world offers. I also think he wants us to make decisions, not sit on the fence. I therefore can't abstain. I believe that would be the easy option. I will be therefore voting against this bill, not because I want to, not because I want young people to smoke, I don't. 
but I want them to be warriors who can say no to the many temptations they may face. Educate them and then get them to rely on themselves to make the right decisions, not rely on the state to make decisions for them. Hugh, I, I hope that we can now limit to there are more people here than I was expecting. About five minutes, please. Uh, Bob Blackman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, I rise to support the bill and to make two declarations. First, as the chairman of the All Party Group on Action on Smoking and Health. And so our objective is to encourage people that smoke to give up and indeed those that are young not to take up smoking at all in the first place, which of course this bill is aiming to achieve. But my second declaration is personal. I don't want anyone else to go through what I went through, which is my two parents dying of cancer of smoking-related diseases. I well remember my late mother gasping for her late, for last breath at the age of 47. I don't want, because she'd been smoking since she'd been 12, and at that time it was almost encouraged by doctors and by the medical fraternity to actually, this was a good thing to do. So the reality is, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to see a smoke-free generation. We've got an opportunity now, because the New Zealand were going to be in the forefront. They've decided not to go ahead, so we can now be in the vanguard of making this the opportunity to have the sm first smoke-free generation in the world. The stakes could not be higher, however, because the reality is that the research from the Univ University College of London says that 350 young people between the age of 18 and 25 take up smoking every day. Since the government announced their proposals, that means that 50,000 young people have taken up smoking. They will face a lifetime of addiction and early death as a result. Now, in my constituency, we have relatively few people who, who smoke, way below the average rates. But still, prior to the pandemic, smoking-related diseases meant 1,300 hospital administration admissions in the last year. People suffer the same inequalities as a result. Now, some people say, oh, well, if we, if we do this, then we're going to not have the taxation uh, to come into the, uh, the Treasury. But in 2023, smoking cost the economy £21 billion. That's more than double the revenue that the government gets from tobacco levies. Now, some people say that actually people uh, that are die early are doing us a favour by not being an imposition on the National Health Service. Absolutely outrageous. We want people to live longer and healthier lives and encourage them to do so. For those people that have this view about the freedom of choice, let us be quite clear. I'm a died in the world Conservative. I believe in free choice. But the only free choice you make if you take up smoking is to take that first cigarette. Because after that, you're addicted for life. The craving is there. And if you want to give up, the fact is that most adult smokers do want to give up. But the reality is that it takes 30 attempts to succeed in order to give up. But only one in 10 smokers actually achieves it each year. So the reality is that if you smoke, you're going to die a horrible death, probably as a result of the diseases that come in as a result of smoking. Now, this bill has the opportunity of creating that smoke-free generation and making sure that young people do not get addicted in the first place. If they're then adults and wish to take up smoking, that's their choice and that's free choice. But it doesn't, and very importantly for this bill, does not criminalise those people that smoke at the moment for either purchasing or using tobacco. The legal obligation obviously will be on the retailers not to sell tobacco to those who are underage. Now, I'm concerned, as many are, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, about the number of young people taking up vaping. The reality is that we don't yet have the evidence of what that will do to their lungs in the future. We know that it will get them addicted to, to uh, nicotine, which is the most addictive drug known to man or woman. The reality is that once they're addicted to some form of nicotine, the temptation is that to go on further. We don't know what 
damage is being done by the delivery mechanism of vaping to people's lungs. And the reality is that medical evidence will emerge. So it's important we take up action now rather than waiting to see what happens. Now, there's clear public support for this. 69% of the public back the Prime Minister's Age of Save Sale proposal, including more than half of all smokers. There is support from across the political parties. The majority of people that vote for each of our parties across the Chamber actually support this proposal. And it shouldn't come as a great surprise, because no one wants to see their children or grandchildren become addicted. Now, very sadly, big tobacco are fighting back. They've, they've even attempted to classify themselves as allies of public health. Now, the reality is that Philip Morris International threatened to take legal action against the government to delay the legislation. So I'm not sure what they think they're saying when their new corporate slogan is delivering a smoke-free future, when the whole aim is to get people addicted in the first place. So the, the other reality is that we've seen Big Tobacco trying to get many of their products exempted from the bill, such as heat not burn and cigars, including exemptions which would undermine the bill before it even starts. Now, the reality is these products still contain tobacco, they still contain harmful products, and they still cause damage to people's health. We cannot allow this to, to happen. One of the issues, for example, is that cigarellos are, are in a position where they're exempted at the moment from standardised packaging laws. We should change that as well, and maybe that's something we could look at in the, as where the legislation takes place. Now, the other reality is that I just want to mention is the position of uh, the, the discrepancies there appear to be between Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and England. In Scotland, they have a very clear requirement for retailers to identify people by their age. And I welcome that. That's the right thing to do. But the bill as it stands does not appear to require that in Wales or in England. And I hope that we can amend the bill uh, as it goes through bill committee to allow that same provision that exists in Scotland, and we should support what they've done in Scotland, to, to, to apply in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And so, Madam Deputy Speaker, I know you're requiring me to, to sit down, but this is a subject that I've been passionate about for rather a long time. And the reality is that from the smoking ban back in 2007, which was led from the back benches at the time, and indeed many Labour ministers voted against the standardised packet, uh, sorry, against the tobacco uh, ban, including the Deputy Prime Minister voted against it, through to the 2015 uh, progress on tobacco control, consistently the measures have come from the backbenches. In fact, colleagues from across this House have helped implement many of those measures. So I'm delighted that the all-party parliamentary group's recommendations have been included in the Khan review and are now being implemented by the government. And I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for going even further when we asked for, which was, uh, which was a, ra a raise in the age of sale, to, be, to create a smoke-free generation by raising the age of sale by one year every year. The reality is that tobacco control measures have consistently passed this chamber and others every single time they've been proposed by overwhelming support from a cross-party basis. I'm confident that this will be no different. Okay. I have to impose a time limit of five minutes. Uh, Vicky Ford. Thank you. Two really important principles crashing against each other. On one hand, the principle of personal freedom. On the other hand, the responsibility of a government to act on public health. We're really lucky to live in a country that treasures personal freedom, and we should be very careful of bans that take those freedoms away. But smoking is the biggest killer, the biggest preventable killer, costing the NHS and the economy billions every year. And most people who smoke wish they'd never started in the first place. They wish that they'd never had that choice. I agree with them. Madam Deputy Speaker, I've lost weight. I took a decision six months ago to give up alcohol. Yeah. Giving up alcohol is far easier than giving up nicotine. But people value that choice to make silly decisions. When they were told they shouldn't bump for an Easter egg all in one go, there was a public backlash. And given that this is about personal choice, I think it's right 
that this is a free vote today. But when I thought about this free vote, I realised that this vote doesn't really affect me. It affects young people, yeah. and young people have a right to be heard. That's why I wrote to secondary schools in my Chelmsford constituency and asked young people for their views. And I'm really grateful for the very detailed feedback from three of those schools. I won't mention which schools because they gave me their confidence, and I don't want them to get in trouble with their peers. One group reported back that the general consensus was a ban was a good thing. Another said they had mixed views, and a third sent me detailed comments from every single year 12 and year 13 studying politics. This, in this group, the number of students supporting the measures in the bill was more than double those who did not. The majority is even greater when you look at the proportion of the bill about vapes versus the proportion of the bill about tobacco. The children commented that the brightly coloured flavoured vapes are targeted at young people. They also worry about the environmental impact, especially of disposable vapes. They'd like to have stronger limitations on disposable products than reusable. They recognise that vaping can help adults to quit smoking. They raise the concern that stronger restrictions on vapes may cause some adults to return to smoking. But they also are concerned about the lack of knowledge of the long-term impact of vaping, especially for young people. Other students pointed out that fixing a set date of birth for those who are able to buy tobacco seems somewhat arbitrary, it feels unfair, could be difficult to enforce, especially as the people get older. Some raise the concerns that younger people will still obtain products, both from vapes and cigarettes, from older people or from illegal sources. All the groups comment on the need for enforcement measures. They wisely point out that just passing a law in this House doesn't necessarily change behaviour. Um, I was pleased that the Health Secretary said that local authorities will be able to keep the process proceeds from fines in order to enforce this. Some of the students were also concerned about the challenges enforcements will have for retail workers and the government's new proposals to introduce a specific offence for assaulting a retail worker may go some way to address this. And one important final point, which I thought they, it was really important to mention, was that some of the young people are concerned that if these items are banned, then other potentially even more dangerous items will take over the usage of these products. Now, all of these points have been mentioned individually by many colleagues in this debate today. And every single one of those points was considered by the young people in my constituency. I was deeply impressed by the thought they gave to it. They value freedom. They value choice. But when asked for their views, the majority of the young people of Chelmsford who responded said they would support the measures in this bill. It was not a unanimous opinion. And I respect those who did not agree. But in a democracy, majority views are those that prevail. Therefore, out of respect for the majority view of the young people in my constituency, whom this bill will affect much more than any of us, I am going to vote for this bill today, because it is their views well. on this bill that I think will matter. Thank you. Mr Graham. What a fascinating afternoon of different speeches. And of course, as my right honourable friend for Chelmsford has just indicated, there are two very different ways of approaching the bill before us. It is very much a personal matter. It's not whipped. And therefore, all of us will have our different perceptions. But I would start by saying that what all of us are here to do is not, as one member said, to try and prevent restrictions on human activity. I don't see that as the reason I was sent to this House. But I believe that we were all surely sent here to try and achieve a better future for the children and grandchildren of our constituents. And then once we've all agreed on that, we can then discuss whether a ban on children from smoking now that will in time mean a restriction, a ban on everyone, is either a wonderful way of preventing uh, not a liberty, but an addiction, or whether taking away that freedom is something that is just a slippery slope towards taking away all other freedoms. And, of course, although we can't measure precisely what the future damage will be of allowing people to carry on 
as we have, being able to do ourselves considerable damage, uh, we do know that the NHS calculates the financial cost currently at £17 billion a year. So for those of us who are also concerned about the size of the state, the use of resources, the productivity of the NHS, the ability of our constituents to have elective surgery when they want to have it, to see doctors when they wish to, surely this is a huge opportunity to make a massive difference, not just to the potential for future generations to avoid that addiction to tobacco, but also to be able to get the health services that they want at a cost that this country can afford. That, I think, is really the crux of what we've been discussing today. And it's very interesting to me, Madam Deputy Speaker, that all the doctors in the House and all the health professionals in our constituencies, as my neighbour, the wonderful MP for Stroud, has highlighted in Gloucestershire, are absolutely united that this is one of the single most important and useful interventions that this House could do. And I think it's huge credit to this Prime Minister that he has set out a vision with clarity, pursues it with determination, and is absolutely clear that were this House to vote this through, this would be part of whatever legacy he in the future leaves as a politician keen to make a difference. So I believe that the idea, on the contrary, that actually encouraging worse health outcomes should continue because it somehow benefits people's freedoms is only a valid one if the whole business of smoking was harmless and largely cost-free. And we know that simply isn't the case. We've heard the data, the cause of 75,000 GP appointments a month, 690 premature deaths in Gloucester Royal Hospital alone, and a new patient every minute of every day somewhere in a hospital in the UK because of smoking. So we cannot argue that this freedom to smoke and to be addicted comes cost-free. And I cannot imagine opposing a bill that supports better health and better life outcomes. Uh, for the libertarians, this in fact helps reduce the size and cost of the state. And therefore, all of these things are fundamentally conservative goals. In fact, they're not even just conservative goals. They're goals, surely, that are human goals that all of us in this House can share. And in all of this, we don't need to think too much about a nanny state, because none of us are keen on the phrase a nanny state or the concept. But how many people here today, Madam Deputy Speaker, would stand up and vote to take away safety belts in cars? or to suggest that everyone could drive motorbikes without helmets now. So I believe that what may seem a slight increase of bureaucracy now will be something that in a few years' time will be seen as so obvious that we will all be astonished there was any opposition at all in due course. So I believe very strongly, Madam Deputy Speaker, that protecting children uh, just as we ban children from being chimney sweeps in generations gone by, banning them from smoking for future generations is exactly what a progressive Conservative government should do. And this bill, if passed, will be one of the most wide-reaching laws that this government and this parliament has done. I am absolutely convinced. Order. Thank you. Anna Firth. Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I support the aim of this bill to create the, the, the first smoke-free generation. It's bold, it's visionary, uh, and I support it. And I want to try and use my time to make four short points, if I can. And Madam Deputy Speaker, it won't surprise you that the first one concerns the new city of South End, because my vision is to make the city of South End safer, healthier, and wealthier for all. But the incidence of smoking in South End is a real barrier to that vision. In 2022, the rate of smoking in South End was estimated to be over 14%. That's 1.5% higher than the national average. But what is even more concerning is that the 2022 figure is 3% higher 
than the 2021 figure. So while it's laudable that smoking rates have been consistently declining in the UK for the past 40 years, the reality is that in some of our coastal cities, of which sadly Southend is one, they are still too high and even rising. So I am delighted that the Prime Minister is seeking to tackle this issue and anything that makes the next generation of South Enders healthier certainly has my backing. The second point is I'm delighted the bill tackles uh, vaping. Uh, recent research, as we've heard, shows that nearly a quarter of children have, are now using vapes with over 10% in secondary schools describing themselves as regular uh, users. Uh, vaping is much, much more concerning because we, we just simply do not yet know the long-term effects. But what we do know is alarming. We know that vaping-related hospital admissions almost doubled in 2022, with 32 of those cases involving children. So bearing in mind, as we've heard, cigarettes were once considered to be perfectly safe, I believe it's simply not responsible to fail to act to stop these young people becoming hooked on these products. But like others, I do have a number of concerns about how this bill will work in practice. There are only 5,000 trading standards officers around the country. How can such a small number ensure that the ban on the sale of these products is enforced? And just as important, as this bill is currently drafted, if someone were to go abroad on a trip, come back with a pack of 200 Marlboro Gold, which apparently are only 37 pounds, uh, uh, the current duty-free rate, at the moment there is nothing to stop them smoking those, giving them to others uh, because they haven't bought them. So that has got to be tackled as well. Um, but like my honourable uh, friend, uh, the, the honourable member for Chelmsford, I've also engaged with my students. Uh, my last cohort of work experience students, all with an interest in politics, very interested in this policy. Students from Westcliff High School for Girls, South End High School for Girls, South End High School for Boys and King Edmunds School all support the aim of the bill. But they too uh, raise a number of intelligent concerns. They want to know how shops already selling illegal and unregulated nicotine products are going to be dealt with when they add uh, illegal vapes to that. They want to know how, as we go forward, people well into adulthood will be ID for nicotine products. How are shops actually going to tackle that? On vapes, they strongly support the ban banning disposable vapes, particularly for environmental reasons, but they're concerned, much more concerned about cracking down on un the underage vaping that's already happening as they are on banning future purchase of vapes. And finally, they raise considerable concerns about the potential for a black market for nicotine products. They pointed out we already see in the illicit drug, tr uh, uh, the illicit drug market the prevalence of unregulated products cut with even worse substances, and they fear we might be opening the door for this to happen with nicotine products as well. So to conclude, I support the principle of this ban. This is about protecting the long-term health of young people in our country, and I will be voting for it, but we must address the real concerns expressed by the very young people that this is set out to protect. Steve Double. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy yeah, Speaker. Yeah. Um, I'm not naturally inclined to be someone who likes to ban things. Uh, I, I certainly uh, lean towards the government uh, uh, intervening as little as possible and only when absolutely necessary. So I have thought long and hard uh, about this bill and whether I would support it or not. And I've come to the conclusion that I will be voting for the bill tonight. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the first reason, because I've heard the arguments put forward by some today about freedom. But the simple fact is that people who are addicted to nicotine and smoking are not free. Uh, it is a life uh, I, I have seen many people suffer with, trying to give up smoking. And any notion that somehow people who are addicted to smoking are free, I'm afraid, is just nonsense. And if we can help people avoid ever becoming addicted to smoking and nicotine, then that is something I think the government should take action on. And I think the way this bill tries to address that issue is absolutely uh, sensible and pragmatic and uh, the right way to go about it. Um, because I've heard, also heard it say today that somehow you know, smoking is a matter of personal choice and freedom and it doesn't really affect 
anyone else. Well, I would challenge people who say that to go and talk to any family. Some of the stories we've heard in the chamber today uh, who have lost loved ones through long and painful deaths as a result of their smoking. There are victims of smoking beyond the person directly involved in their family and also the huge pressure that it puts on our health systems, the damage it does to our economy. Uh, all of these things are prices that we all have to pay for the addiction to smoking that so many struggle with. When I, when I read that statistic that 75,000 GP appointments a week are directly as a result uh, uh, of smoking, um, I was astounded. I'm sure we all have our inboxes full of constituents who say they're struggling to see their GP. And can you imagine if we freed up that capacity within primary care, uh, what a difference it would make? So for those reasons, I believe that it is right on this occasion for the government to intervene. Um, and I also, uh, you know, some of the points that have been made about having to uh, uh, check the age of someone in their 30s or 40s about whether or not they're uh, eligible to buy tobacco. The reality is that's just never going to happen because the whole point of this uh, these measures is to stop people smoking in the first place. We know most people start smoking when they are young and by helping them avoid ever starting smoking when they're young we just won't have people in their 30s or 40s wanting to buy cigarettes and that is absolutely the point. I also very much welcome the measures in this bill uh, with regard to vaping. I have been incredibly concerned about the way that Vaping has taken hold, particularly of young people in our country. I absolutely understand and acknowledge it's a very useful tool to help people get off cigarettes and, and take up vaping instead. But the reality is, in our country now, it is about so much more than that. And I think it, it, it is shameful the way that some of the vape manufacturers have deliberately tried to get young people addicted to vaping so that they're locked into being their customers for the rest of their lives, just as the tobacco industry has done for too long. And so I welcome the measures uh, that the government uh, are taking to, 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 um, to, to try and uh, make vaping less attractive to young people. I would also, also suggest that maybe we need to go further, that if we say the main aim of vaping is to help people get off smoking, then why don't we ban vapes also from anyone uh, who is uh, born before the 1st of January 2009? Because if they're not going to ever smoke, they're not going to need vaping to get off smoking. And it is one way I think that we could actually go further to improve this bill and actually prevent young people ever taking up vaping uh, uh, in the first place. And I think that would be incredibly welcome. We don't actually know the long-term damage that vaping is doing to people. We're starting to see some of the evidence come forward of the number of young people who end up in hospital as a result of vaping. And I am deeply concerned that just as with tobacco, if it was being licensed today, with all that we know about the damage it does to people's lives, we would, we would probably not license it or approve it for sale. I am concerned that the long-term impact of vaping we don't yet understand and it is going to uh, reap a, a, a damaging effect on our young people's house. So this bill isn't perfect, but I, I absolutely uh, acknowledge and respect the, pri pri the Prime Minister's aims in coming forward with something that is bold, that is really going to address this important issue in our society, and I am happy to support the bill this evening. James Grundy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, and uh, I rise today in an unusual position because, as people know, I smoke like a chimney, but I am, uh, I, I'm going to give the government the benefit of the doubt tonight, even though I have concerns about the enforceability of some of the measures in this bill. Uh, and the reason is this. Um, for those of you who are regular readers of the Lee Journal, and I realise my audience might not include too many of those, I have written repeatedly about the problem of illicit and illegal tobacco and vapes in Lee. Uh, and the simple truth is that there is real concern uh, that quite a lot of these products are a means to money launder for the gangs that cause the heroin problem in Lee and the people smugglers. Uh, and uh, I've previously spoken, uh, once again, about the Lee Journal, about how Lee was one of the endpoints of an international smuggling gang based in the Balkans that used illicit tobacco and vapes as part of their criminal enterprise. 
Um, and uh, I know some people have, have got up today to speak about this bill and don't think it's right and aren't going to support the government. Well, I'm going to support the government, but I'm actually going to complain about the bill as well, because I say <laughs> the government should go further. The government must go further. I think if someone is selling illegal tobacco and vapes, uh, they, they should be held accountable. If someone was selling, uh, for example, beer or spirits made out of turpentine or toilet water, people would be outraged and there would be a demand for action. But that is happening day in, day out, week in, week out, with illegal and counterfeit tobacco and, uh, and vapes. Um, because some of this, these products are made uh, either illegitimately to copy, inverted commas, legitimate products, um, in sweatshops in the Far East, uh, and some of the some of the vapes um, they include they, they include something up to ten times the legal limit of nicotine, uh, and we simply do not know, as some of our colleagues with medical knowledge uh, have spoken in this chamber about today, what damage that will do to young people. Um, uh, my view is that the, the, the way we should go further on this is we already have a mechanism to license shops. It's the alcohol license scheme. I believe that we should expand uh, the alcohol licensing scheme run by the local authority uh, to tobacco. And it should be an alcohol and tobacco license. You can't apply for one or the other. It's got to be both. And if you are caught selling a dodgy two quid vape to a 14 year old, you should have your license taken away so you can no longer sell alcohol either. And I guarantee Madam Deputy Speaker, that that would basically bring about a cleaning up of the system because nobody is going to take the risk of selling a dodgy two quid vape to a 14 year old and risk the loss of the ability to sell alcohol to a much wider pool of people. And those that do, Madam Deputy Speaker, I suspect will be the organisations that are actually fronts for the drug dealers and the people smugglers. And we should also trigger an automatic HMRC investigation into those people to follow back the chain of the dodgy vapes and the dodgy tobacco and find out who they are. And, I, and not only should we take away their licences so they can't sell uh, alcohol and tobacco, we should fine them, not £50 as been talked about earlier on, but £10,000. Let's teach them a lesson. Let's really go for this, because the black market in tobacco and vapes already exists. I know people have been talking about this, but it's already there. It's costing the Treasury millions. It's funding other criminal activity, as I've said, heroin dealing, people smuggling. It's got to come to an end. So the only criticism I have for the government today in regards to this legislation is that it doesn't go far enough. We need more robust regulation because a giant black market in tobacco and vapes is already there. It needs to be done via the existing licensing system, uh, which already exists for alcohol, and it needs to have concrete outcomes that will shut these dodgy, dodgy shops and cut off a source of funding for these dangerous criminal gangs that also operate in heroin dealing and people smuggling. Uh, I know that the government has the right intention on this. As I've said, I have doubts about some of the detail, but I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt today. But I urge the government to strengthen the legislation, and it will be, the benefit, it will be to the benefit of us all if they do. Let's deal with these criminal gangs as, whilst we deal with this issue of public health, because the two, I'm afraid, are deeply intertwined. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Shadow Minister Preet Gill. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's a pleasure to respond to this debate on behalf of the opposition. We have heard some powerful contributions today from members on both sides of the House in favour of this bill to bring an end to the smoking epidemic and crack down on vaping companies that are preying on kids. I want to thank the Honourable Member for Winchester, Bromsgrove, Stockton North, Harrow East, Earwash, Bolton, Stroud and Bladen for their moving contributions on the harms of smoking and the importance of this bill. And let me also pay thanks um, to my honourable friend for North Tyneside, York Central and Dulwich and West Norwood for the excellent points made about the growth in vaping. We've also heard some opposition to this bill today as well. The right honourable member for Rosendale and Darwin cited the example of people openly taking Class A drugs in public without reprimand as evidence that bans don't work. 
I dare say he's just made more of a point about the decline in policing and local enforcement under his government yeah. rather than age of sale legislation. And to the right honourable member for South West Norfolk, I simply say that if wanting to stop future generations getting addicted to products that may eventually kill them makes us the health police, then the health police we are. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker. There is no argument for the harm that tobacco does to the people of this country every day. Smoking is the single biggest preventable cause of ill health. It leads to 80,000 deaths a year in the United Kingdom and is responsible for one in four cancer deaths and over 70 per cent of lung cancer cases. Smokers lose an average of 10 years of life expectancy. Smoking, as we've heard today, is not a free choice. It is an addiction. Hence, raising the age of sale will help reduce pressure on the NHS by improving health and well-being. My constituent, Eric, knows this too well. He is one of thousands of constituents whose life has been put at risk by smoking. Like the vast majority of smokers, Eric began smoking when he was a child, at age 14. It wasn't until his 50s that Eric was able to give up cold turkey at the request of his daughter, who urged him to do so on behalf of his newborn grandson. Eric has suffered a heart attack and stroke and lives with hypertension, high cholesterol and COPD. As he says, COPD is an incurable mortal disease. It makes getting around harder and harder for me. And the experience of people like Eric is why the last Labour government took radical action with the smoking ban in 2007, yeah. a defining public health achievement. And it is why, from opposition, we welcomed the Khan review and we proposed the generational smoking ban a full 10 months before the Prime Minister made his announcement at his party yeah. conference. There is wide support for this bill from everyone in the NHS, in the wider health sector, and the general public, and the only people who seem to be fighting it tooth and nail are the tobacco companies and conservative backbenchers. The former member for Blackpool South called it health fascism, and the former Prime Minister, whose Chief of Staff worked for Philip Morris and British American Tobacco, has called it unconservative. What is it about the tobacco industry that some Tory MPs love so much? Every year, the NHS bails out big tobacco to the tune of billions. The Prime Minister might not feel he has the strength to take on these vested interests and whip his MPs to vote against them, but he can rest assured that if they can't get it over the line, Labour will. Yeah. As welcome as this bill is, the Government has had 14 years to take stronger action on smoking. Four years ago, the Government said its ambition was a smoke-free Britain by 2030, yet it is currently estimated to be at least seven years behind its smoke-free 2030 target and not on course to meet it in the poorest areas until 2044. The generational smoking ban will help us get there, but it will not help the six to seven million adults who already smoke. And as many members have raised today, sm stop smoking services have faced savage cuts. Yeah. The number of smokers who quit through stop smoking services has dropped from 400,000 a year in 2010 to around 100,000 today. So does the minister regret not doing more to bring down smoking rates over the past 14 years? The government has belatedly committed more funding to stop smoking services now, but the uplift in funding she is offering will not take us back to the number of people setting quitting dates that we achieved in 2010. So what assurance can she offer that her measures will actually get the government on course to hit the 5% smoke-free target by 2030? Yeah, yeah. And while the bill is strong on tackling the tape take up of cigarettes and vapes by young people, it does little to help those who are already addicted to quit. Recently, a school in my constituency had to apologise after handing out a leaflet to a child suggesting smoking as a self-help measure. Does the Minister agree with me that it is scandalous that the myth that smoking reduces stress and anxiety still persists? And does she agree with me that her bill should include a requirement to make tobacco companies include information to dispel that myth in their products? The bill also includes a range of powers to tackle the issue of youth vaping. Labour welcomes this. For years, Labour have been warning about the explosion of young people getting addicted to nicotine with products that look like teddy bears and yeah. sippy cups and yeah. Yeah. come in flavours like yeah. unicorn yeah. shake. And it is why Labour voted to ban the marketing and branding of vapes to children in 2021. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, Labour leads and this government belatedly follows. Yeah. Yeah. But in the meantime, an estimated 255,000 more children aged 11 to 17 
have been addicted to vapes, according to the Ashes survey data. So does the Minister regret taking so long to wake up to this issue? And according to the Trading Standards Institute, while youth vaping has soared, so has the number of illegal products flooding our market, which many members have raised today. Up to one in three vapes sold in shops are estimated to be illicit. It means children are being exposed to vapes that contain heavy metals, antifreeze, poster varnish, as well as illegal levels of nicotine, getting them hooked for life. So can the Minister explain how she expects to bring in effective new regulations on vapes when her government are barely in control of the black market now? And does she agree with me that there needs to be a cross-government strategy to tackle the smuggling of potentially dangerous products into our country? And has she considered giving the MHR new powers to, to screen products before they actually come on the market? And can she also confirm that her bill will provide powers to tackle not just the sale, but the import of dangerous products? <laughs> to conclude, Madam Deputy Speaker, after 14 years of the Tories, healthy life expectancy has dropped for the first time in modern British history. Labour supports this bill, but after 14 years of failure and with the NHS in crisis, we regret that it marks the last desperate attempt of this government to rescue a legacy on public health. And for 14 years, the government has played politics with public health, putting off prevention measures, knowing that taxpayers tomorrow will pay the price. But the country is paying for this now. Labour will always put public health first, prioritise prevention to ease pressure on the NHS, improve access to smoking cessation services, and take on the tobacco and vape companies profiting of people's health. Thank you. Yeah. Minister Dame Andrea Ladson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I do want to start by thanking the many lung cancer and asthma charities, as well as ASH in particular, for their advice, research and support. And I also want to personally pay tribute to the Chief Medical Officer for England for all of his commitment to making the strongest possible case for this life-changing legislation, and also to the Health Ministers right across the United Kingdom for their collaboration in what will be a UK-wide solution for future generations. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, turning to the honourable gentleman opposite who opened for the opposition, I was very disappointed. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I like the honourable gentleman for Ilford North. He once, he once said on air that was death to his career. I don't know why would he have said that, Madam Deputy Speaker. But I'm really disappointed today because he wasn't listening. He had some very sensible questions from my honourable friends about consultation. They were raising very serious points about flavours for vapes and how they might help adults to quit. He was not listening. He was making party political points. In fact, he barely said anything sensible about this legislation. All he did was talk politics. I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate the fact that his side have been whipped to support this bill, whereas on my side, colleagues are trusted to make their own decisions on something that has always been a matter for a free vote. He sits there shouting from a sedentary position on political point scoring yet again. And I'd like to turn to the Honourable Member for Birmingham, Edgebaston, who did raise a very serious question about stop smoking services. I can tell her that the government has allocated £138 million a year to stop smoking, which is more than doubling. So this side's commitment to helping adults to stop smoking is absolutely unparalleled. Now, I'd like to also thank the Honourable Member for East Renfrewshire for her support to, for the bill and also for the collaborative approach of the um, of the government in, in Scotland for their work in bringing forward this, uh, this collaboration between all, all parts of the United Kingdom. I also particularly want to pay tribute to my right hon. Friend, the Chairman of the Health Committee, for his excellent speech yeah, yeah. and his strong case for long-term policies that will prevent ill health and thereby reduce <laughs> the pressures on the NHS, yeah. something that is so important. He raised the question of when will we see the regulations uh, and the, the, the consultation on vaping flavours and on packaging and location in stores, and I can tell him that it is our intention 
intention to bring forward that consultation during this Parliament, if at all practicable. I also want to thank my right hon. Friend, the Member for Bromsgrove, for his tribute to Dr Javid Khan for his excellent report into the terrible trap of addiction to nicotine. He made the point that it is simply not a free choice, it is the total opposite. I would also like to thank uh, the Liberal Democrats um, and the spokesman for the Liberal Democrats for saying that they will support the bill at second reading. I am not quite sure where they are going on the smoking legislation, but I am grateful for their support for vaping. And I do hope to be able to reassure them during the course of the legislation. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, the case for the bill is totally clear. S smoking cigarettes are the product that, when used as the manufacturer intends, will go on to kill two-thirds of its long-term users. That makes it different from eating at McDonald's or even drinking, what was it, a pint of wine, one of my colleagues was <laughs> suggesting. Very, very different. Smoking causes 70 per cent of lung cancer cases. It causes asthma in young people. It causes stillbirths. It causes dementia, disability and early death. I will give way on that cheering. I uh, <laughs> thank uh, the Minister for uh, giving way and for all the uh, House's uh, attention to my declaration of members' interests as, as a practising NHS consultant uh, uh, addiction psychiatrist. Um, would, she, um, would she share my concern that what we have heard from the libertarian right today is a false equivalence between uh, alcohol, um, bad dietary choices and smoking, and that moderate alcohol, moderate bad, e bad eating are very different from moderate, moderate smoking, because moderate smoking kills, and it means that people live on average 10 years shorter lives, and it means less healthy lives. And would she, would, she, would she agree with me that this is not about libertarianism, this is about doing the right thing, protecting public health and protecting the next generation, and that's why we should all support this bill. I am grateful to my honourable friend. He makes such a powerful point, speaking with such authority, and similar points to those made by my honourable friend for Sleaford and North Highcombe, who also, speaking as a paediatrician herself, with great expertise on this matter, is absolutely true. It is a false choice. It is not a freedom of choice. It is a choice to become addicted, and that then removes your choice. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, every year over 100,000 children aged between 11 and 15 light their first cigarette. And what they can look forward to is a life addicted to nicotine, spending thousands of pounds a year, taking maybe 30 attempts to quit with all of the misery that that involves, and then experiencing life-limiting, entirely preventable suffering, and then two-thirds of them will die before their time. 83% of people start smoking before the age of 20, and that's why we need to have the guts to create the first smoke-free generation across the United Kingdom, making sure that children turning 15 or younger this year will never be legally sold tobacco. It is the single biggest intervention we can make to improve our nation's health. Smoking is responsible for around 80,000 deaths every year, and, Madam Deputy Speaker, it would be worth taking action if the real figure were half of that, or even a tenth of it. And not only that, but there is also a strong economic case for the bill. Every year, smoking costs our country at least £17 billion, far more than the £10 billion of tax revenue it draws in. It costs our NHS and social care system £3 billion every year, with someone admitted to hospital with a smoking-related illness almost every minute of every day, and 75,000 GP appointments every week for smoking-related problems, a massive and totally preventable waste of resources. And for those of us on this side who are really trying hard to get access to the NHS for more patients to be able to see their GPs. This is a really good target for us to be focused on. And then on the positive side, creating a smoke-free generation could deliver productivity gains of almost £2 billion within a decade, potentially reaching £16 billion by 2056. 
improving work prospects, boosting efficiency and driving the economic growth we need to pay for the first-class public services that we all want. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I know that honourable members who oppose this bill are doing so with the best of intentions. They argue that adults should be free to make their own decisions, and I get that. But what we're inviting, what we're urging them to do is to make their own free decision to choose to be addicted to nicotine. But that is not a choice, and I urge colleagues to look at the facts. Children start smoking because of peer pressure and persistent marketing telling them it's cool. And once hooked, I know from experience how hard it is to kick the habit. I took up smoking age 14, and my little sister was 12 at the time, and we used to buy 10 number six, Madam oh. Deputy Speaker, oh. and a little book of matches, and we would, yes, smoke behind the bicycle shed and at the bus stop oh. on the way home from school. Yes, I know. I know. I'm outing myself here. So I took up smoking age 14. I was smoking 40 a day by the age of 20, and I gave up as my 21st birthday present to myself. But today, with all this talk of smoking, I'm now 60, OK, so do the maths. That's 40 years later. I still feel like a fag sometimes, because we're talking about smoking all the time. It's that addictive, 40 years since I smoked. So this isn't about freedom to choose. It is about freedom from addiction. Now, there's another angle to this. The tobacco industry are, of course, giving dire warnings of unintended consequences from raising the age of sale. They say it will cause an explosion in the black market, exactly what they said when the age of sale went from 16 to 18. But in fact, the opposite happened. The number of illicit cigarettes consumed fell by a quarter. And at the same time, smoking rates for 16 and 17 year olds in England fell by almost a third. Raising the age of sale is a tried and tested policy, and it is a policy that is supported by a majority of retailers, raised by a number of colleagues, quite understandably, but raised by over 70 per cent of the British public. I will give way briefly. I beg from my friend. If I'd known she'd been such a teen smoker, I would not have recruited her to the Conservative Party at the tender age of 18, like at Warwick <laughs> University. <laughs> can I just say, can I say to her, I've always taken a free choice approach to health matters. And as Shadow Children's Minister, I had to lead on the tobacco advertising uh, ban and the public uh, smoking uh, ban as well. We were wrong to oppose them. Who now? would think it remotely normal that people can smoke around us in restaurants and in other public places. And does she not agree that this measure today, in a few years' time, will seem just the same as banning smoking in public places? And why didn't we do it earlier? Well, of course, as I've said, ever since I met him age 18, he's always right. I, I can never disagree with him. But now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to say a few even more furious words about vaping. It is just appalling to see vapes being deliberately marketed to children. At pocket money prices, in bright colours, with fun packaging, with flavours like bubblegum and berry blast, and with the vape counter right next to the sweet counter. So, yeah. Um, but before my right honourable friend just gets too furious about vaping, can I just ask to clarify two points on smoking, just dragging us slightly back. First of all, she said that it's extremely important because of the addictive nature of nicotine that we stop people smoking from 15. I don't support that, but can I ask her, first of all, if it's so important, why aren't we starting at 17? Because it's already illegal for 17-year-olds to smoke. What's the magic of the 15? If you really believe it, why delay? And the second point I made, she said in relation to her own experience, I'm a former smoker myself, she started smoking at 14, I started smoking at about 14 as well. It was illegal when I started smoking at 14. It didn't stop me. I said, I'm a lawbreaker, how shocking. It didn't stop me. Why does she think this ban on people starting smoking under the age will be different? I, I'm, grateful, I'm grateful to my right honourable friend for, for raising these really important points. Um, we will as I will come on to, we will be putting £30 million a year of new enforcement money into trading standards and our enforcement agencies to really clamp down 
on enforcement, and we are making it illegal to sell cigarettes to anybody turning 15 this year. And he asks why. Well, it's precisely because we're trying to bring it in with a decent amount of notice so that people can prepare for it, precisely to protect retailers and um, all of those sectors that will be impacted to be able to prepare. So coming back to the area on which I am seriously on the warpath, and that is trying to get kids addicted to nicotine through vapes totally targeted at them. I went out to Hackney to, to to visit some retail um, shops, to see the vape counter right next to the sweet counter, and to see how it's absolutely not about me. It's not trying to stop me smoking. It's trying to get children addicted. Such cynical, despicable methods. Yet, sadly, for too many kids, they are already an incredible marketing success. One in five children aged 11 to 17 have now used a vape, and numbers have trebled in the last three years. I'll give way briefly. I'm very grateful to her for, for giving way as she uh, ploughs through all of this. I wonder if she can share with me her views on the advertising of vape products on sports kits and via sports facilities. Yes, the Honourable Lady um, is, is aware that there's very restrictive advertising already on smoking and vaping, and we're actually very concerned that, uh, that some advertising is breaching advertising standards regulations, and I will be writing to them specifically about that. But going on, Madam Deputy Speaker, parents and teachers are incredibly worried about the effect that vapes are having on developing lungs and brains. And the truth is we don't yet know what the long-term impact will be on children who vape. So since I was appointed, I've done everything I can to ensure this bill will protect our children. The government's position is clear. Vaping is less harmful than smoking. But if you don't smoke, don't vape. And children should never vape. We will definitely make sure that people who smoke today continue to have access to vapes as a quit aid. This will absolutely not change. But we cannot replace one generation that's hooked on nicotine in cigarettes with another that's hooked on nicotine in vapes. And that's why we're using this bill to take powers to restrict flavours and packaging and change how vapes are displayed in shops. And so, just to reassure again, the Chairman of the Health Committee and my right honourable friend for Rossendale and Darwin, we will plan to consult on this before the end of the Parliament, if practicable. And the disposable vapes ban will likely take effect in April 2025. Those regulations have already been published. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, these are common sense proposals that strike the right balance between helping retailers to prepare, giving sufficient notice, and also protecting children from getting hooked on nicotine, whilst at the same time supporting current smokers to quit by switching to vapes as a less harmful quit aid, supported by £138 million a year. Our approach is both realistic to those who smoke now, but also resolute in protecting children. And just like banning smoking in indoor public places and raising the age of sale to 18, I'm convinced that in 10 years' time these measures will seem commonsensical to all of us. In decades to come, our great-grandchildren will look back and think, why on earth didn't they do it sooner? So I urge all honourable and right honourable members to vote for this bill as the biggest public intervention in history, and I commend this bill to the House. Thank you. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. no. Quite take it on the voices. Division! Clear the lobby!
Yeah, 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 yeah. Order! The question is that the bill be now read a second time. As many as that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. 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 Tell us for the ayes, Aaron Bell and Mike Wood. Tell us for the nose, Gareth Johnson and Craig Whitaker.
Order! Order! The eyes to the right, 383. The nose to the left, 67. The eyes to the right, 383. The nose to the left, 67. So the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Unlock. Programme motion to be moved formally. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order paper, as may as that opinion say, aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Money resolution to be moved formally. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Ways and means resolution to be moved formally. I beg to move. The question is, as on the order paper, as many as that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Thank you. That concludes business on the bill and we move to the presentation of public petitions. Mr Ian Lavery. Thank you um, Madam Deputy Speaker. I wish to present a petition on behalf of those infected and affected by the contaminated blue scandal, particularly on behalf of my constituent Sean Cavins. Sean was one of the youngest people in the country to be infected with hepatitis as a result of contaminated blood products. He's campaigned tirelessly for justice for those impacted and continues to raise a tragedy of those passing away before justice is done. This is for Sean and all of the others who have been impacted by the scandal. The petition states, the petition of residents of the constituency of Wandsbeck declares that people who have received infected blood and who have suffered as a consequence have along with their families waited far too long for redress. The petitioners therefore request that the House of Commons urges the Government to implement the recommendations in the second interim report of the infected blood inquiry without delay. Petition Recommendations of the Infected Blood Inquiry. Thank you very much. I beg to move that this House do now adjourn. The question is that this House do now adjourn. Alicia Cairns. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and thank you for granting this important debate. The solar industry will play an important role in the Government's net zero plans, with a target of producing 70 gigawatts of solar energy by 2035, a five-fold increase on our current output. Now, it is absolutely right that solar plays its part in increasing our renewable energy output, but the current rollout lacks national oversight of land use, sufficient consideration of food security issues and protection of agricultural land, and on protections against the widespread exposure of solar supply chains to Uyghur forced labour and genocide. I will. It's very early on, but to my friend, I absolutely will. Secretary, it's very early on. I, I thank the old lady for giving way and for, for bringing the debate. In 2022, I brought a bill to this House that would have prohibited the importation of products made by forced labour from Xinjiang. I'm sure that nobody in the UK would want to un- believe that the products that they were buying were the product of s- slave labour. And it would have put the onus on manufacturers to prove that they hadn't been made by slave labour. Does she agree with me that this would be an important step forward if the government were to adopt such a policy? I couldn't agree more with my honourable friend. And actually, I laid a very similar amendment to the energy bill earlier this year, which I will touch on later, because he is absolutely right. And in 2021, Sheffield Hallam University published a report called In Broad Daylight, Uyghur Forced Labour and the Global Solar Supply Chains. They summarise the situation as many Indigenous workers are unable to refuse or walk away from these jobs, and thus the programmes are tantamount to forcible transfer of populations and enslavement. Their second report, Overexposed, went even further. It created a ranking system for solar companies based on exposure to Uyghur slave labour, which I'll come to later in more details. Now, these two reports were funded by the Foreign Office, 
and yet their findings do not appear to have been enacted. I will happily give way to my friend. Can I commend the Honourable Lady for Rutland and Nelton for bringing this forward? We spoke earlier on the day. Uh, she always leads by, uh, from the front, and I, I congratulate the Honourable Lady in doing that on this issue as well. It is an important issue we may not always know very much about, but does the Honourable Lady not agree that any hint of forced labour within this chain cannot ever have government backing and funding, and that we must hold ourselves to the highest standards in matters of forced labour in every supply chain that may be centrally funded? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's no surprise that my honourable friend wishes to speak in this debate because he always brings compassion and heart and a real care for human rights. And he is absolutely right that if green energy is to make up such a substantial part of our future energy grid, we must not tolerate slave labour within it. As I mentioned in response to my honourable friend, uh, the uh, lovely Scott Nationalist thereover, I did indeed lay an amendment uh, trying to make sure that any solar company wishing to build in this country had to make clear their supply chains and that they were free of Uyghur forced labour. Now, the government wasn't willing to support the amendment, but I was assured that they would work with me on the issue. Conversely, I wish to take the opportunity to thank the many members of this House who did back this effort. The Foreign Affairs Committee has also done its own inquiry into exposure to Uyghur slave labour as a follow-up to the genocide um, situation in Xinjiang, and I have raised it in countless other meetings and debates. And yet we still see no action as dirty solar continues to flood and concrete over our fields and our rooftops, unchecked and unaccountable. That's why last month 43 members of this House and 32 human rights organisations sent a joint statement to the Government requesting three simple policies that could be enacted to insulate the UK solar market from Uyghur forced labour. The first was to introduce import controls on high-risk industries to insulate our markets. It's not unreasonable, and I don't think it's too onerous, to expect solar developers and manufacturers to demonstrate their supply chains are clean of slave labour before not only operating, but profiting in the UK. The second request was targeted sanctions to ban the worst offending companies they cannot operate in the UK. And the third was complementary measures to diversify solar supply chains away from Xinjiang and Uyghur forced labour. By adopting these, the government could clean up the UK solar industry and ensure our green transition does not come off the back of slavery and genocide. Now, we've yet to. I will indeed. I thank the Honourable Member for giving way and also congratulate her for bringing this very important subject before the House. The US and EU are passing laws to ban solar products made by Uyghur slave labour in Xinjiang, which will leave the UK with an abundance of morally compromised solar panels. So does my honourable friend agree that the fight against forced labour should be a collective responsibility? And if so, does my honourable friend also agree that this means the UK government must work for a clean energy transition, but without being complicit in Uyghur forced labour? Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman is correct. The UK is risking becoming a global outlier because our international partners have taken action. As he says, the USA passed the Forced Labour Prevention Act in 2021. The EU is in the process of passing legislation to block the imports of goods made with forced labour. And this means that we are becoming a dumping ground for these solar panels. Since June 2022, the US has seized thousands of shipments of solar with links to Xinjiang and yet we are yet to seize or block a single import ever. The US's import controls are working, with the second Sheffield Hallam report showing that many companies have started creating new supply chains for exports to the US that are clean. But without our own import controls, the UK will continue to welcome dirty solar. Sheffield Hallam's report also offers an assessment of the largest solar company's exposure to forced labour. Now, whilst the Chinese Communist Party seeks to cover up the genocide it's committing in Xinjiang by ban banning independent audits and investigations, hiring PR firms and issuing lies on a daily basis, the researchers were able to use open source research to rank the culpability of companies from a scale of none to very high. So let's look at some of those companies, shall we? JA Solar, very high exposure to Uyghur forced labour yet has continually ranked as the biggest supplier of solar modules to the UK. Jinko Solar, very high exposure, panels widely available to buy in the UK. Longi Solar, very high exposure, panels widely available to buy. 
Q cells, very high exposure, panels widely available to buy. REC Group Twin Peak 4, very high exposure, again, widely available to buy. Tongway Solar, high exposure, partnered with the UK company Polysolar to distribute their panels nationally. Trina Solar, very high exposure, they have an office in Derby. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, that brings me on to Canadian Solar, the company behind the proposed 2,000 acre Mallard Pass solar plant in Rutland and Lincolnshire. Now, I wish to put very clearly on the record that anyone who wishes to look at my history in this place knows that I have raised issues around the genocide against the Uyghurs since 2016, long before I came to this House, and specifically again about slave labour with supply chains long before this proposal came to my constituency. But unfortunately, I am now in the situation Rutland faces having Uyghur blood labour on our beautiful green land, and I will not accept it. Canadian Solar's application to build Malar Pass, which would classify as a nationally significant infrastructure due to its enormous size, 2,100 acres, is currently with the Secretary of State, who will decide whether to grant planning permission. I've lost track of the number of times I've raved Canadian Solar, whether it be at the Foreign Affairs Committee or whether it be in this place or in Westminster Hall. Now, people say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. But I would argue that in this case, Madam Deputy Speaker, insanity would be allowing a company so linked to the oppression and genocide of the Uyghur people to build key energy infrastructure in our country. The name Canadian Solar is what I will call maple washing to distract from its true origins and operations of the company. As of December 2022, 86% of their annual solar module manufacturing capacity was in China. 78% of their solar cell manufacturing capacity was in China. And 100% of their annual wafer and ingot manufacturing capacity was in China. And 85% of their employees are based in China. Canadian Solar has letters of credit worth $150 million and short-term notes worth $1.4 billion with Chinese banks. Now, whilst their operating in China is of itself not a concern, it does offer some context as why Canadian solar supply chains are so intricately linked to human rights abuses in Xinjiang. Now, in 2021, four shipments of Canadian solar with solar panels were seized by the US government. Why? Because of their links to slave labour from the Uyghur Xinjiang region. Canadian Solar previously operated a solar plant in the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps, 3rd Division City of Tamshuk. The XPCC is a Chinese Communist Party controlled paramilitary organisation in Xinjiang, heavily implicated in the Uyghur genocide. In fact, four of their senior officials were sanctioned by the UK in 2021. According to the Sheffield Hallam report, Canadian Solar likely benefits from this relationship with the XPCC. They also have a joint venture with GCL Poly one of the largest suppliers of polysilicon. GCL Poly was, yet again, sanctioned by the US. Why? For participating in the practice of accepting or utilising forced labour in Xinjiang and contributing to human rights abuses against Uyghurs and other minority groups in Xinjiang. Now, Canadian Solar, after I launched my campaign to expose them, has, of course, removed all references to their partnerships with GCL Poly from their website. But, of course, archive form and press reports means that we still have the evidence of it. As of December 2021, Canadian Solar's primary suppliers are Longyet Green Energy, Hongwa New Material and Tongwei Solar, all companies with subsidiaries operating in Xinjiang with links to Uyghur forced labour. I have provided full written briefs on each company's links to the forced labour to Desnes in the past. Now, in June 2022, Madam Deputy Speaker, Canadian Solar's own shareholders attempted to deselect several board members. Why? In action over forced labour in their own supply chains. In December 2022, the U.S. Commerce Department found Canadian Solar guilty of tariff dodging. This means that they took their solar panels from China to Thailand, tried to disguise them, and then shipped them to the U.S., but they were caught out. Sadly, the attitude of the company is best discerned by a leaked email from their CFO, Chang, who faulted human rights organisations for their work when he said, they mistakenly regard any employment of Uyghurs as forced labour, which has caused severe harm to the Uyghurs we all love. There you have it, Madam Deputy Speaker. According to Canadian Solar Senior Management, the responsibility for the genocide and the use of slave labour does not lie with the Chinese Communist Party and the companies who use their labour for profit. It lies with the brave NGOs and human rights groups who dare to highlight their plight. All the evidence is there. I have raised it countless times, and so I want to ask the Minister directly, Will we now change the MSIT rules so that the links to forced labour are finally considered? Because I don't believe there is any other form of procurement in this country, particularly public sector procurement or for the national good, where we don't take forced labour into consideration. Will the government act against blood labour-made products polluting our shores? And if not, why? I want to preempt 
rather cheekily what I think the Minister may raise here, which is the Solar Stewardship Initiative. Anyone who's followed my interventions again will know that I've been very sceptical of an industry-led solution to this problem. The Solar Stewardship Initiative, led by Solar UK, was published last September. Its ESG doc, however, does not mention Uyghur forced labour a single time, despite it being set up to prove that there is no slave labour within their chains. In fact, it devotes only one short paragraph to forced labour, but doesn't set out how it will be identified in supply chains, consequences for companies who are proved to have found to benefit from it. If we go back to the list of companies I gave Madam to speak to, and I recognise it was long, both JA Solar and Jinko Solar, companies ranked as having very high exposure to forced labour, are already certified as SSI members. Apparently there isn't a problem with slave labour in their chains, despite the Foreign Office report saying that there is. I was also very disappointed when Solar Energy UK, when I met with their chief executive, refused to remove Canadian Solar as an industry lobby group, despite the overwhelming evidence against them. I fear we will now see a similar attitude from Solar UK as they come forward, and it does seem, I'm afraid, illogical to allow an industry so tainted by forced labour to be allowed to create its own certification programme with zero, and I mean zero, external oversight. So can the Minister please set out what active mechanism will exist to examine the supply chains of SSI certified members and what the consequences will be for those found to benefit from Uyghur forced labour within their supply chains? And can the Minister confirm that he is confident the SSI will clean up the UK solar market of its connections to Uyghur forced labour? Now, whilst I believe that any solar company with links to Uyghur forced labour should be banned from operating in the UK as a matter of principle, it is also worth investigating what Chinese supply chains mean in practice for our environment and going green. The process of mining and manufacturing solar panels in China relies heavily on coal power. Professor David Rogers, an expert in ecology at the University of Oxford, estimates that due to these coal-dependent supply chains, solar energy produces three units of carbon for every one unit behind wind energy. Only biomass has a larger carbon footprint than solar from renewable forms of energy. In a study by the World Bank comparing 240 countries, the UK was found to have the second lowest potential for solar photovoltaic potential, with only Ireland less suited to solar energy. Explains why I'm so pale. There is not much sunshine in my English-Irish heritage. Uh, solar installations in the UK, maybe I should talk about Scotland next, but I think I'll move swiftly on. Uh, solar installations in the UK generate maximum power for an average of 2.6 hours a day. They fall to less than one hour a day in winter. Solar plants produce energy when we least need it, during hot and sunny periods, and contribute little to nothing during peaks in demand in the winter when it is dark and cold. Battery storage is carbon intensive and can only extend solar power supplies by two hours and not in between sessions. So an 140-acre solar plant can provide roughly enough electricity for 9,000 homes, whilst just one wind turbine in the North Sea can power 16,000. We are not blessed with abundant sunshine, as I am living proof. But what we do have is wind and plenty of it, and we have the Celtic Sea. So therefore, I would ask the Minister why the government continues to sacrifice green belts and agriculturally rich land for inefficient, carbon-intensive solar made with Uyghur slave labour, when we should be investing in wind energy, a technology that we rightly lead in, and we should be so proud of our record in wind, where we have achieved enormous things. I want to finish by paying tribute to the member of Sleaford and North Highcliffe for securing a debate in Westminster Hall on Thursday this week on solar plants. I hope the Minister will note how many debates are being held on this issue and that members' concerns are significant. Another area that has been increasingly raised is the need to protect both and most versatile, best and most versatile agricultural land. Responding to a written question I submitted in February, the Minister for Nuclear and Renewables confirmed that Desnes is not currently monitoring what types of land or how much land is being used for solar developments across our country and has no plans to do so. That, for me, is deeply concerning as someone who has over 400 farms in their constituency. How is the Department able to answer members' questions about how much BNB land is being lost if the government themselves are not recording it? Although I have had a conversation this week with the Secretary of State for Farming and he does give me hope that DEFRA may be recording this information. The Mallard Pass solar plant alone would see 1,000 acres of Grade 1, not Grade 2, not Grade 3, Grade 1 BMV land lost, and yet maybe this would not even be recorded by the government. And whilst the total amount of UK land used for solar might be small, the type of land being cost is, lost is key. Crops and solar like the same thing, flat, sunny landscapes, and so it's no surprise that over 50% of all solar applications in this country are in Rutland and Lincolnshire. Two counties that are the breadbasket of the UK are now being concreted over with solar panels.
So at a time of global food insecurity, when 46% of our food is currently imported, does the Minister agree with me that food security should be a government priority, and will he instruct his officials to begin monitoring how much, what type and in what area soda is being built? And I'm very relieved that the Farming Secretary will be bringing forward a national land strategy, again, something I've been campaigning for, and I hope this will better protect BNB land. Finally, Madam Speaker, I met with the Government previously to discuss compensation schemes for solar. So could the Minister please provide an update as to when we will expect a new industry standard for solar compensation? It is absolutely right that the wind energy industry came together. They put forward a proposal and it's now standard across the country. And yet, for example, in Rutland, we were offered something like, I think it was £100,000, £400,000 to compensate for the next 40 years of losing 2,100 acres of good quality arable land, with one of our villages, Essendine, 96% surrounded by solar. In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, the evidence of Uyghur forced labour in the solar industry supply chain is abundant. It is laid out in Foreign Office funded reports, in the evidence collected by the Foreign Affairs Committee, in sanctions imposed by the US government and in the documents of the offending companies themselves. Over the last four years, I have done all I can to shine a light on this evidence. And now, with the support of 42 members of this House and 32 human rights organisations, I have asked for three simple policies to bring the UK in line with our international partners so we don't become a dumping ground and we can finally clear up the solar industry. One, introduce the import controls. Two, sanction the worst companies. And three, enact complementary measures to diversify because solar should be part of our final makeup of our energy, uh, our energy platform. But it must be on buildings, it must be on brownfields, and it must be on grade four, and that is where it should be. I also ask the Minister to commit to reaching out to his counterparts in the US and EU to discuss their Uyghur forced labour import controls and how we can learn from them. Our transition to net zero is gathering pace, and we must not, and must not let up. I am so proud that we have decarbonised faster than any other major government. It is an incredible achievement what we have done. But we cannot go green off the back of slavery and genocide and blood labour. Our green and pleasant land is being tainted by solar plants produced with this Uyghur blood labour, and it is the responsibility of all of us and the government to prevent this. I see it as a new form of great injustice that we will be going green off the backs of dirty made solar panels in China because we don't see how they're made, not least the dirt and the, how they're made for the environment where they harm it, but also the slave labour that we then benefit from in our country. I think there is a really concerning historical parallel there. We have the information, we have the solution, and now we need is some, all we need is some action. Work with our allies, fall in line with international standards and do what we all know is the right thing and refuse to allow the Uyghur genocide to continue and yet somehow play a role in it. I know the Minister deeply cares about slave labour. I know the Minister, when he was a backbencher, spoke out frequently on these issues. I also know that he is very aware of the threats from the Chinese Communist Party and the way in which they treat Uyghur uh, activists and all those living in Xinjiang. So I would like to thank him for the fact that his door is always open to me and the fact that he always takes the time to discuss these issues with me. But we do need to take action and we need to do so now. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Minister Andrew Bowie. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, let me begin by thanking uh, uh, the Honourable Lady, my Honourable Friend, and she's a friend, for securing what is an incredibly important uh, debate. Uh, I absolutely recognise her dedication and eagerness to tackle the serious issue, noting her recent joint letter to the Secretary of State for Energy Security and Net Zero, alongside the Foreign Secretary and the Secretary of State for Business and Trade. So let me be very clear and get right to the issue. UK businesses and solar developers should not countenance receiving solar panels from companies that may be linked to forced labour. This government has been very clear on its position regarding the abhorrent practice of forced labour and our expectations on companies to do everything in their power to remove any instances of forced labour from their supply chains. That is why it was this Conservative government which introduced new guidance on the risks of doing business in Xinjiang, enhanced export controls and announced the introduction of the financial penalties for those who failed to report, as required, under the Modern Slavery Act. It was this Government which led the charge and announced in September 2020 a requirement of large businesses and public bodies to report on specific areas within their modern slavery statements, including their due diligence processes in relation to modern slavery. And additionally, it was this Government which recently passed the Procurement Act to enable public sector contracting authorities to reject bids and terminate contracts with suppliers which are known to use forced labour themselves or anywhere in their supply chain. 
But this remains a complex issue, Madam Deputy Speaker. And my honourable friend is absolutely right. We must continue to review how we can best tackle forced labour in supply chains. I can promise her that we have not ruled out taking further measures and additional measures in the future. Across every part of government, and not just in the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, we are continuing to engage and work with our international partners to understand the impact of measures to combat forced labour around the world. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland has a strong record at holding countries to account for instances of forced labour. The government has led international efforts to make China accountable for its human rights violations in Xinjiang. We were the first country to lead in a joint statement on China's human rights record in Xinjiang at the UN. And our leadership has sustained pressure on China to change its behaviour. Madam Deputy Speaker, in October 2023, the UK led another joint statement on Xinjiang at the UN, and at China's Universal Periodic Review in January, the UK urged China to cease the persecution of Uyghurs, allowing them genuine freedom of religion or belief and cultural expression without fear of surveillance, torture, forced labour or sexual violence. We have also imposed sanctions and consistently raised China's human rights violations with the Chinese authorities at the highest level. The Foreign Secretary last did so with China's Foreign Minister in February. Turning to the, the issue of the solar sector in general and the presence of forced labour in solar supply chains, first, I should probably set out the importance of solar energy as a key part of the government's strategy for net zero, energy independence and growth. We are aiming, as the uh, Honourable Lady said, for 70 gigawatts of solar capacity by 2035. The UK does have huge potential for solar power. It's a cheap, versatile and effective technology that is a key part of the government's strategy for net zero energy independence and clean growth. It's a part of a, a wider energy mix, and the Honourable Lady was absolutely right to reference our strong leadership in uh, offshore wind. We have the first to fifth largest offshore wind farms in the world. We're investing in new technologies and, indeed, in our new nuclear capacity. So it is a part of a wider mix to get to our net zero future. On solar, however, I recently co-chaired the final meeting of the Solar Task Force alongside Solar Energy UK at 10 Downing Street. In fact, within the Solar Task Force, and with thanks to the pressure from my honourable friend here, we established a specific subgroup within that task force to consider the wide-ranging actions needed to develop solar supply chains that are resilient, sustainable, innovative and free from forced labour. This work will inform the government's solar roadmap, due to be published uh, in the next few months, which will set out the trajectory and actions needed to deploy up to 70 gigawatts of 2035. One of the main topics of discussion at the Solar Task Force was the Solar Stewardship Initiative, referenced by the Honourable Lady already this evening, which is a solar supply chain insurance scheme developed, piloted, audited and launched by the UK's main trade association, Solar Energy UK, working alongside its European counterpart, Solar Power Europe. In fact, the UK government co-sponsored the development and publication of Action Sustainabilities Addressing Modern Slavery and Labour Exploitation in Solar PV Supply Chains Procurement Guidance to provide further tools to industry to ensure the responsible sourcing of solar panels. Madam Deputy Speaker, I have been largely pleased, actually, to see the response from industry following our work on this, and I am delighted to highlight that on the 28th of March, 55 companies and organisations across the solar sector signed a supply and change statement highlighting their commitment to ensuring the solar sector is free from any human rights abuses, including forced labour, anywhere in the global supply chain. Resilient, sustainable and innovative supply chains are essential to support the significant increases in solar deployment needed to deliver the UK's ambition for 70 gigawatts of solar capacity. By 20, I'd be delighted to give way to the Sorry. opposition. Um, I, thank, I thank my honourable friend for giving way on this point. I, I met with the Chief Executive of Solar UK, and when I said to him, what happens if one of the companies who signs up to your solar stewardship scheme isn't keeping itself free of slave labour? What will you do? And he didn't have an answer for me. And I said, well, will you kick them out? Will you exclude them? And he said, well, we don't have a mechanism to do that. So have things changed where there is now a mechanism to exclude? And how are we making sure they are actually auditing? Because, again, he said they're taking it upon the company's words when they sign up that they are free from slave labour. They are not having to provide any evidence that they are free of, free of um, slave labour when they sign up for this initiative. I thank the Honourable Lady for the question. On her latter point, there will be more detail on exactly uh, how the auditing process will uh, uh, proceed when we publish the Solar Roadmap in the next few months. On her former point, I, I, I must be absolutely clear from this dispatch box that if a company is engaging in uh, buying uh, 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 pieces for their equipment uh, that they knowingly know 
have been developed using slave labor in Xinjiang or indeed anywhere else in the world, they should be held to account and they absolutely should not be allowed to remain as a part of the initiative. That is absolutely the view of the department, this government and indeed the wider industry uh, itself. The government already encourages developers to grow sustainable supply chains through the supply chain plan process, included in the contracts for a different scheme, for a project over 3,300 uh, megawatts. And yes, my honourable friend. Thank you, Minister. I know the time's limited. Uh, I think the Minister referred to 55 companies, I think it was. I just want to ask, those 55 companies, I, I'm presuming that within those companies there are, there are companies from Northern Ireland as well. So it's important that we, we have a, a policy that affects all of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland so that they're all accountable. I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman for the question, and uh, yes, I can assure him that if uh, th 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 this covers what we are speaking about this evening uh, and the industry initiatives that I am uh, laying out this evening covers every part of our United Kingdom, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and if any companies uh, are involved within Northern Ireland, then of course they will be covered by uh, these schemes, these initiatives, and indeed by the legislation that we have passed to ensure that we do get to the, the root cause, which is to remove uh, slave labour from the supply chain. The UK has scoped to grow industries producing an innovative solar technology whilst also crystallising our position as world leaders in cutting-edge solar research and development. In doing so, we can create new green jobs, providing levelling up and significant export opportunities while building up UK capability and resilience and increasing energy security by reducing our reliance on imports. Meanwhile, we support the efforts of our allies to increase and accelerate the diversification of solar supply chains by reshoring manufacturing. We continue to work with countries like the US, Canada and Germany to ensure access to these solar supply chains remains resilient. The Honourable Lady also referred to the situation of solar uh, on agricultural land. And the government recognises that in some instances solar projects can affect the local environment. It is important the government can strike the right balance between these considerations and securing a clean, green energy system for the future. That is why the planning system is designed to take account of these issues. However, I am aware of, an, of the number of issues arising uh, from uh, 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 these deployments, these planned applications, and I am engaging and discussing with many uh, colleagues and indeed their communities on this and seeing what we can do to, uh, uh, to, to, to ensure that those communities' concerns are indeed listened to. So I'd like to close by again thanking my honourable friend for bringing forward this important debate. I look forward to continuing to engage with her on this vitally important issue.